Um, so we have a new great section this morning. It's about uh, eruptive, eruptive phenomena. And uh, the first speaker of this morning is uh, Greg, Greg Erzak uh, from the uh, Kohli Institute for uh, Astronomy and Astrophysics in China. And um, so he will speak about uh, accretion variability through the disk lifetime. And Greg, I will give you five minutes, uh, uh, okay, for... Uh, um, okay. No, 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 no. <laughs> That's all I need. Honestly, I have no idea what I'm going to talk about. So, you know, five minutes is fine. Oh, uh, go ahead. Yeah, and Thank you. it's a it's a real honor to uh, you know be helping celebrate uh, Lee and Nuria's uh, amazing uh, legacy in star formation. Uh, I think I'm supposed to say that I wish I was there, uh, but I don't know. I've become really antisocial the past couple of years, so. Uh, I'm sure if I was there, I'd be having a great time, and uh, I'd miss you all, and uh, hope to see you all at some point soon, but uh, also happy to be here, um, and I'm uh, just really thankful I can help celebrate. Uh, I was assigned to talk about accretion variability, and uh, I was kind of confused what I should be talking about, uh, and in part because the other speakers uh, are probably covering this really well. Uh, and so, you know, there's a fantastic paper by Venuti uh, earlier this year, but, you know, she's talking. And so it's actually probably good enough to talk about a second time, but uh, I didn't want to do that. Uh, and, you know, that's through the entire conference, right? And so uh, I'm going to do something a little bit that I don't really like to do in her view talks. Uh, and that's going to be talk a lot about work that I've been involved in. Uh, and so I apologize for that, but I didn't quite know what else to do. And uh, I should also note uh, on here, you know, Lee is actually surprisingly uh, competent at making these illustrations, right? These are pretty good. Um, I certainly couldn't do anything like that. Uh, and so, you know, the these light curves, uh, you know, especially that came out of YSOVAR with uh, Anne Marie and John Stauffer's amazing work. And before that, uh, Sylvia probably talked about her crow work, right? These all show kind of a lot of small fluctuations, sometimes bursts, uh, but they're all small stuff. Uh, and a couple of other papers that I wanted to highlight on kind of the small stuff uh, is nice work by uh, Alex Schultz's student and Tim Naylor's student. Uh, separately, kind of showing that, you know, things change by about 0.3 dex. Uh, and uh, similarly, a plot that I just made about an hour ago uh, is you get the same thing for TW Hydro. Uh, no matter how much we want, we always have to study TW Hydro, but there's over 1100 spectra in archives. Uh, and if you analyze TW Hydra, uh, you get kind of the same 0.3 dex change. Uh, and that changes after about one night. Uh, so if you observe, uh, you know, within an hour, it's probably about the same, but after a day, your 0.3 dex change, and then that doesn't change much, regardless of whether you're observing the next day or the next year. Uh, and that's work that actually Guang Chen started during his undergraduate, and he's now a postdoc, so to tell you how old that work is, but it's gonna get published. Uh, but so that's all small stuff, uh, but then there's also the big stuff, right? The things that really matter in uh, forming a star and affecting uh, all of the disk envelope processes. Uh, and those are the FUR and uh, EX loop type outbursts. Uh, most of these are discovered from optical monitoring, uh, which means that they're gonna be optically bright uh, probably, uh, you know, the less embedded types of these objects that we're finding. Uh, and so, you know, how important are these large outbursts in the growth of a star? And uh, I've had a lot of fun working with a few people, some of whom are here on a, a protostars and planets uh, chapter. Uh, and so I uh, stole this with permission from Will. Uh, Will Fisher remade this plot from his 2017 paper uh, that shows that, uh, you know, I'm sure that you've seen this BLT diagram quite a bit at the conference. 
uh, or envelope versus luminosity. Uh, and you know, they can explain the distribution in luminosities uh, without needing outbursts, right? So they don't need, they don't require large outbursts during the stellar growth. You can put all of that high accretion rate uh, time early in uh, the stellar growth, and that's fine. Uh, but that also doesn't rule out uh, that large outbursts are important. Uh, and so I, I think it's safe to say that we don't know whether large, out, out, large outbursts contribute 1% or 30% of the stellar growth. Uh, and so, you know, why would we care about that? Um, of course, for people who uh, like to rant about ages uh, and somehow Lee and Lynn have gotten me to rant about this uh, more than uh, I'd like to admit. Uh, you know, it affects the birth time, right? It affects how much energy uh, gets put in this, or uh, entropy that gets put in the star. Uh, and there's been a lot of work on this recently. Uh, it's important to note that FE wars may actually be very inefficient, inefficient uh, at radiating and at vector energy. And uh, I think that's probably one of Lee's more proud papers uh, that you can't find in AFJ, it's just uh, on the archive. Uh, and then, you know, these large outbursts can also reset the uh, chemistry in the disk in the envelope. Uh, they serve as a probe of disk physics that we couldn't necessarily probe otherwise. Uh, and then you can do some interesting chemical stuff. Uh, so the cartoon on the right is from Jung and Lee's work. Uh, where she could study the methane abundance in a disk uh, because all of that methane, uh, which is normally in ice form, uh, was uh, sublimated into the gas form and is then measurable. Uh, so you can do some interesting things with these outbursts. Uh, but for protostars, they're hard to detect, right? The FU wars uh, are typically found by optical surveys. Uh, and so how do you evaluate uh, the role of bursts? Uh, and the main ways to sort of do it have been very indirectly. Uh, so there's been beautiful chemistry work. Uh, yes, Jorgensen and his group have uh, been the leaders at pushing that, but many, many others have had great contributions where you can look at, for example, CO uh, and depending on uh, where the CO is coming from in the envelope. Uh, you can say where the snow line is, where it should be uh, based on the current luminosity and infer whether there was a recent burst. Uh, or you could look at jet shocks uh, and guess that these jet shocks are uh, related to past outbursts. Uh, but both of these are very indirect. So uh, we've had the idea of, you know, why not looking for these bursts directly? Uh, and so our first attempt at this was actually with Herschel uh, and it failed. Uh, others succeeded, others got a little bit of time. Um, we were always a little bit skeptical of doing this. So, you know, you can see that we were questioning ourselves in the proposal. Uh, and, you know, our outreach activities were ambitious, but if any of you were on the tack, you know, the state of the world, it's your fault, right? Our outreach activities would have brought peace on earth, goodwill towards humans, but we didn't have to do that. Uh, fortunately, another proposal uh, I'd pledged to talk about astronomy to somebody sitting next to me on a plane, and I'm glad that that one was rejected because I would not have wanted to do that. Uh, but uh, it was very reasonably rejected. We hadn't done our homework yet. And so uh, we thought through what would happen if you put uh, an accretion burst uh, and bury it in the envelope. Uh, the time scale for dust heating is very fast. Uh, and so the main time scale that you have to worry about uh, is just the light travel time scale uh, as uh, a packet of energy produced at the protostar uh, gets absorbed by dust, uh, perhaps scattered, rescattered. Uh, eventually the dust heats up and then you get to a tau of one surface uh, where the photon is at long wavelengths, uh, and so then the photon uh, can escape. Uh, and the typical time scale for seeing those change, the temperature changes in the envelope uh, would be 
hundreds of hours, so few week time scales. Uh, and, uh, and then we did some uh, SED analysis. Uh, you really want to be in the far infrared, uh, but the far infrared is obviously very challenging. And if you want something over several years, Herschel is not going to work at all. Uh, the near infrared gets pretty confusing, uh, and mid infrared as well. So longer wavelengths uh, work actually really well. So the change in luminosity that you get is, or the change in brightness that you get is much smaller because the envelope is acting as a calorimeter. Uh, so you don't get a huge change in brightness, uh, but you can get some change. Uh, and the geometry doesn't really matter, uh, especially for variability. Uh, the geometry of the envelope's not changing. Uh, and so you're just seeing uh, whatever dust is uh, around the star. Uh, you'll see that dust heat up and the brightness change because of it. Uh, and then the, the time scale for the energy to escape uh, is actually a pretty good thing. It smooths over uh, all of this short time scale uh, weather that, the, uh, that we see when we look at K2 or any other light curve. Uh, it just smooths over that. So we can't really see anything uh, that the dust is doing on anything less than a week, couple weeks time scale. Uh, and then the other thing that came along was uh, Will Fisher actually detected some submillimeter uh, change uh, in uh, a very red object, HOPS 383, uh, where you could see the change very easily uh, in the submillimeter. So this kind of convinced us, and we could convince tax using uh, this sort of thing. Uh, and so we started the uh, JCMT transient survey to try to understand how stars gain their mass by looking for uh, protostellar variability uh, for stars that still have their envelopes. Uh, we think this is the first submillimeter kind of long-term monitoring program. Uh, and it's been led by Doug, uh, jung Lee, and myself. Uh, and we've had a fantastic team. Uh, I've listed some of the contributors uh, below. Steve Mayers especially has been critical for developing the technical uh, needs uh, of really improving the flux calibration that we needed uh, for this survey. But we've had great, we've had a great team. Uh, I know that Jan and Tyler are in the audience and maybe others. Uh, and there have been contributions from a lot of people. Uh, and so we've been surveying eight regions, uh, relatively small regions, uh, for uh, the past five some years. Uh, and we've recently added a couple of intermediate mass star forming regions uh, to increase our statistics. Uh, so we have pretty long term light curves now for these regions. Uh, and the flux calibration, uh, typically in the submillimeter, the flux calibration is good to 10% and not really quantified. Uh, and so Steve Mares, who is a student of Doug Johnstone's, developed uh, the submillimeter version of differential photometry uh, to get us down to about 2% at 850 microns. Uh, and I think we're down to about 1% now through improvements that are coming uh, in the next year. Uh, so this requires other sources in the field. We need you know, we have, these are star forming regions. So there are a lot of other sources in the field uh, and we need them for flux calibration. Uh, and you can see the kind of the alignment before and after this calibration, the alignment on the right is much better, uh, which lets us do our science. Uh, and so a few sample light curves of uh, some interesting objects. Uh, I think a lot of you are familiar with V1647 Ori a uh, nice outburst uh, from previous optical surveys. Uh, Serpens SMM1 is whopping bright, and it's gotten brighter from our survey. Uh, and then on bottom are two sources that I'll be talking about in a little bit more detail. Uh, EC53, which is a nice period. I think I'm getting some feedback. Uh, nice periodic source, quasi-periodic. Uh, and then HOPS373, which is undergoing an outburst now. Uh, these are 850 micron light curves. We also have 450. 
uh, but they're kind of noisier. Uh, they show the same sort of trends, uh, but with more noise because the atmosphere is worse. Uh, so this summarizes a little bit of how we've been looking for and quantifying uh, the variability. Uh, Young He Lee, uh, a student of Jung and Lee's, just published a paper uh, a couple of months ago uh, where we fit light curves with uh, sinusoids, lines, uh, and we look for stochastic behavior uh, to empirically describe what we see. Uh, there's only one quasi periodic source uh, that's EC53 with a period of two years, um, on the, or one and a half years, shown on the bottom. Uh, other sources kind of show longer periods, which means that they're not periods, they haven't turned over yet, uh, but it's, it was an easy way to quantify what we're seeing. Uh, and these changes are typically 10 to 20% in the submillimeter. Uh, they're not huge, uh, but 20% uh, could be a factor of two to three in accretion rate. Uh, so the luminosity, accretion luminosity change is much larger than the brightness change we see in the submillimeter. Uh, and you can see on top uh, our false alarm probability. Everything above this line is uh, a strong detection. So you can see that uh, on the brighter end of our sample, we get a lot of detections. Faint end, it, it gets much harder. Uh, we have 60 really good bright protostars that are bright enough to uh, evaluate variability. And about 30% of them uh, are varying. Uh, this shows the same sort of plot, uh, only in T-bowl versus brightness on the bottom and volumetric luminosity on the top. Uh, and the circles, the filled circles that then have a circle around it uh, are all of the variables that we're seeing. Uh, and so again, for uh, the bright sample, uh, we're seeing a lot. For the cooler, objects, the things that are probably evolutionarily younger, uh, we see more variability. Uh, but uh, we're still a little bit concerned that there may be uh, some biases in there and that uh, those class zero sources have larger envelopes, more massive envelopes. Uh, and so they're going to be brighter and it's easier to detect changes. Uh, so we, we still need to do some work to figure that out. Uh, the source that we've spent most time on uh, is EC53. Uh, it was first detected as a variable in the near infrared by uh, Klaus Hodap. Uh, and the millimeter K band, uh, H band, J band all look pretty similar. Uh, the, it goes up pretty quick, uh, about, about a month. Uh, and then the decay is about three fourths of a year. Uh, and the accretion rate change over this is about a factor of three. Uh, and interestingly, just before it brightens, the H minus K gets much redder, uh, which we think is the disk kind of getting bigger. Uh, and so this source has cycles of filling and draining uh, that occur on 18-month uh, timescales. And they seem similar to uh, sources that uh, Scott Dom and Lynn have evaluated, and then uh, previously uh, Muzrol. Uh, so it's not. Uh, you know, completely new thing, but it's an interesting little source. Uh, we also then uh, decided to move to NeoWise uh, and evaluate some of the amazing NeoWise light curves. Uh, and we did the same sort of thing uh, in terms of curve fitting. Uh, so you can see some curve fits on the left uh, and kind of an evaluation of the variability on the right. So the further to the right or the further up in this plot, uh, the object is gonna be uh, more variable. Uh, and we split them into protostars, disks, and pre-main sequence plus evolved stars. Uh, and protostars are more variable uh, than disks. And then the pre-main sequence, the Diskless and evolved stars are not surprisingly uh, less variable. So these are beautiful light curves. So just wanted to show a few of them. Uh, and I should mention also, this is built on 
kind of previous analyses uh, using two data points uh, that Alex Schultz did uh, and the early WISE data and then uh, Will Fisher, uh, both comparing kind of WISE and Spitzer. Uh, and so with NeoWISE, you can get beautiful light curves over uh, seven years now, uh, plus then a few extra years if you add the first WISE points. Uh, and some of these are pretty big changes uh, and, you know, kind of one or two magnitudes. Uh, these are all W2. Uh, and V1118 ORI is uh, the source on the left, uh, second from the bottom. Uh, so that's an uh, EX loop type object that uh, many of you are familiar with. Uh, and so W2 is changing quite a bit. Uh, all these, all the light curves that we analyze are going to be on Vizier. Uh, once it gets ingested there. Uh, the light curves all come from the sample uh, started with uh, Mike Dunham's C2D sample. Uh, so we weren't doing an all wise, we weren't trying to cover everything. Uh, we were just trying to look for, we were trying to do statistics on a well-defined sample uh, so that then we could generalize from those statistics. Uh, so, you know, looking for outbursts in uh, other places is uh, great. And, you know, I think we'll be hearing from uh, Phil about some exciting things and Agnes as well. Uh, but our goal is trying to do statistics. Uh, a note of caution, uh, you know, all these stars are gonna be variable uh, in the mid infrared. So we defined a threshold uh, for variability uh, and then uh, define anything above that is variable uh, for, uh, our definitions. Uh, we identified many of the known uh, burst and outburst sources that are in the Dunham sample. So kind of confirming that our approach is doing well. Uh, we use an, we state an outburst rate of one every thousand years, but there's huge caveats with that. And there's really large caveats with interpreting uh, any of these NeoWise uh, light curves without additional follow-up. Uh, a lot of different things can cause mid-infrared variability, uh, including, you know, you can get changes in the inner disk uh, and whatever else. So interpreting this as a change in accretion uh, is not always clear. Uh, but we do get a nice relationship when we take the objects that are changing in the submillimeter and compare that to NeoWise changes. Uh, so this is work from Carlos Contreras Pena, uh, where there's a really nice relationship going from the submillimeter to the mid infrared. The opposite would not be true because the mid infrared has a lot of other things going on. Uh, uh, one source that we've looked at uh, in more detail uh, that was initially identified as variable through our submillimeter light curve, but shows a beautiful uh, NeoWise light curve as well as uh, HOPS 373. Uh, you can see the differential photometry at 850 microns on the left. Uh, and uh, this work from uh, one of Jung Yoon, Jung Yoon Lee's students, uh, Sung Yoon, Sung Yoon. Uh, and uh, we've also been following it in the K-band and they're uh, a nice, sort of small burst uh, everywhere, uh, but W1 is much bigger than W2. Uh, and it required some follow-up to understand uh, what's going on. Uh, the source is, uh, when it's observed with single dish, uh, it's split into two different uh, continuum sources, uh, but one of them has the outflow and seems to be the thing that is varying. Uh, but then when we look at the near and mid infrared, uh, that emission is all coming from uh, the outflow cavity. Uh, so the source is very deeply embedded. Uh, the mid infrared is not tracing the disk, at least not directly. Uh, the mid infrared emission may still be produced by the disk, uh, but then it would get scattered uh, from the outflow cavity. And what we see is emission uh, from the outflow cavity rather than from the star itself. Uh, when we go to longer wavelengths, we see the star and envelope, uh, but at short wavelengths, we see the emissions scattered. Uh, 
Uh, and then in K-ban, uh, the K-ban in W2, the variability is very suppressed. It's much smaller than it is at W1 and what we would expect from the submillimeter. And the K-ban spectrum from Gemini uh, shows H2 dominates. Uh, and the, at W2, it's probably also dominated by a combination of H2 and CO fundamental emission. Uh, and so both of those probably aren't changing uh, and that would suppress any continuum variability that we'd see. Uh, a couple last things uh, before I wrap up. Um, there's, we detected a very bright coronal flare uh, on uh, this binary uh, star in Orion. Uh, you have five minutes left. It only has, thanks. Um, I'm, Couple more slides, so right on time. Uh, this source uh, was only bright for one epoch, and during that epoch, we could split it into different uh, bits of time, uh, and it decayed by a factor of two. And so this is a coronal flare, uh, and so you can do coronal studies uh, in this submillimeter. Uh, this is the first coronal flare detected in the submillimeter, uh, and it might be the most coronal flare around of solar type corona, uh, although pre-made sequence. Uh, and then often uh, people are trying to understand flux calibration with ALMA uh, and uh, Logan Francis, a PhD student working with Doug Johnstone. Uh, we have a program where we're doing something similar uh, is what we're doing with the single dish JCMT, but interferometry adds uh, additional problems. Uh, the automated calibration gets to 10%, but with larger outliers, uh, we can get down to 3% accuracy uh, by using calibrators, by adding targets uh, that you need if you really want to do flux calibration very well. Um, and a note of caution, the in-band spectral indices are only reliable to 0.8%, uh, or the flux between the different segments. Uh, is reliable to 0.8%, uh, which means that in-band spectral indices have very large uh, uncertainties. Uh, and so I would like to wrap up there. Um, I'm really excited to see uh, the next few talks uh, from Agnes and Phil uh, and Lynn, who are going to talk about uh, all this stuff in a lot more detail. Uh, and then I also wanted to advertise uh, Odysseus, where we're not doing young stars, we're doing the you know, classical T. Tauri stars, uh, but a really unique uh, far ultraviolet survey. Uh, it's a DDT program uh, led by Space Telescope uh, and Odysseus, which I managed to spell wrong there, uh, I guess in keeping with misspelling things in the program. Um, it's, we're kind of a large group that is coordinating and analyzing uh, UV spectra uh, and getting a lot of other data to go along with it. Uh, so SPAT uh, just, uh, we're working on uh, the referee comments uh, and should be resubmitting soon for our kind of first uh, overview paper to show what we can do. And uh, so I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Herc. Greg. Um, questions? Barda? Yeah, thank you for a nice talk. Uh, you've shown uh, an object V371, uh, uh, which has uh, inner disk uh, periodically accreting on the central star. What, what's the size of that uh, region that is periodically accreting? I just missed the time scale. Yeah. Um, the time scale is uh, 18 months. Uh, where did it go? Um, so it, it's a very small region. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, I see. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, in the paper, we go through arguments about viscous. Uh, you know, you can make assumptions about alpha and things. Uh, and it's... Uh, we didn't really dig into the types of instabilities, but we tried to provide broader arguments that then theorists could use to interpret the observations.
Uh, we have a question from Zoom as well. Uh, if you want to unmute, uh, Shinsuke. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, I have a question about the variable protostars. Um, do you have any plans of multi-epoch X-ray observations for them? Uh, which uh, X-ray uh, are using X-ray that we, we can probe the, the very in the very central regions uh, in the in the embedded uh, objects so that it would be fun, I think. Oh, yeah, I'm not quite an X-ray expert. Uh, we have Jan Forbrick, I think, is uh, on the call. Uh, and so I could defer to him. I don't know if people have been doing that or not, um, but he would know much more about uh, that. We, we have not planned that. Um, but I know that Jan has beautiful X-ray observations. Ring treat. Um, uh, thanks, Craig. A nice talk. Um, uh, I want to make a comment or, or an advertisement, so to speak, um, for what concerns the time scales, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, the the outbursts of uh, HIMARS uh, um, objects uh, can be well traced by by the maser flare, right? And um, and what we see is that um, even when the maser flares. Um, um, uh, 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 finished, right? We see an, an inf uh, infrared or far infrared afterglow, and uh, this is quite interesting. And um, we got um, the first results uh, using time-dependent radiative transfer simulations. Uh, Alessio's poster summarizing uh, this, uh, these events, and um, part of the poster is also um, um, uh, dynamic uh, SEDs. Uh, which show the influence of the opening angle on the on the, on the heating uh, disc on the cavity opening angle on uh, on heating and, and, and um, cooling time scales. So we get a better idea now how this depends on the distribution of the optical depths around the object, which is basically the key issue right there. Yeah, thanks a lot for that comment. And you know, I should have given more of a review talk. Uh, the Maser work that you and other people have been doing the past couple of years has been uh, fantastic. Uh, and uh, just speaking personally, you know, Mazers had always been kind of this weird thing that uh, it wasn't really clear how to use them. Uh, and I think the past few years, you guys have really brought them into, uh, it, it's matured. Uh, I think there's, you guys are still working through a lot of the issues, but it's really matured where uh, you're now making sense of a lot of things. And, uh, you know, you're, like you said, you're seeing the changes in uh, the infrared that correspond to what you'd expect if you're interpreting the masers uh, like you want to. Uh, and so a lot of things are coming together there. Uh, and for people in the audience who are like me and kind of ignoring maser work for a while, uh, I think it's time to go back and look because it's beautiful. Uh, I love the paper also where, uh, you know, seeing the maser with time uh, irradiate the disc or the seeing the maser from the disc uh, from the protostellar uh, the burst uh, and getting the disc rotation uh, so that then you could dynamically mass measure the mass of the central star. Um, just beautiful stuff. So thank you. And I should have included more of that. Uh, okay. We also have one last question from Zoom from Brandt. If you want to unmute. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for the really great talk. Um, following up on one of the previous questions, uh, instead of x-rays, have you looked also at if um, you've there people have observed similar uh, changes in spectra for non-thermal radio emission in case, for instance, there's um, enhancement of particle acceleration in the jet or near the protostar that would lead to uh, in enhancements in the radio emission from non-thermal non processes. Yeah, uh, I think I'd defer to Jan Forbrick again. Um, you know, we've thought about doing a little bit of that. Um, the time scales are never quite clear. Um, 
but we're, we've certainly been ex thinking about uh, how to combine this with outflows. Um, the non-thermal, one of the issues with non-thermal and harder x-rays would be uh, whether you're probing the accretion flow, which is what we want to do, or uh, the kind of coronal physics, uh, which is separately fascinating, uh, but not our direct priority in this program. Okay. Yeah, in terms of the difference between the coronal or the accretion um, work that myself and Marco Padovani have done, uh, we there are differences in the you know particle spectra. For instance, if you're looking at outflow or um, the accretion shocks or the corona, so there might also be then signature changes in the non-thermal emission, or hopefully, if there's ever a low energy gamma observatory, something changing there as as well. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank again, Craig. Our next speaker now is uh, Agnes Kospal from Concoli Observatory. The title of uh, her talk is uh, Young Eruptive Stars in the View of the Lattice Observations. Thank you very much. I would like to first thank the organizers for inviting me to give this uh, review. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Agnes Kospal. Uh, I'm from Konkoli Observatory from uh, Budapest, Hungary, where I'm working with a lot of excellent colleagues in my ERC group, uh, some of whom are participating at this conference, so feel free to interact with them. I will uh, mention some of their work during my talk. So uh, Greg, before me, I gave a nice overview of uh, accretion variability uh, through uh, the disk lifetime. And in this talk today, I'm going to focus on the most extreme cases, the young eruptive stars. Eruptions are uh, interesting and important, not only because uh, the eruptive phenomenon might be more widespread than we thought, but also because the temporarily increased uh, luminosity and the temporary increased brightness of these objects uh, allow us to study uh, certain aspects of the star, forming, star formation that would otherwise remain inaccessible. So let me start with showing you uh, the time evolution of, of accretion rate. You can see in this graph that, that uh, shows the accretion rate as a function of time that uh, protostellar accretion and disk evolution is not a smooth process. It shows these very brief episodes when the accretion rate can increase by several orders of magnitude. There are indications both from uh, observations and from theoretical studies that it happens like that. You can see uh, that uh, some of these um, peaks in, in this sketch are called fewer outbursts and XOR outbursts. As you already heard several times during uh, this week, fewers and XORs are different classes of uh, variable stars, collectively known as young eruptive stars. Um, so the story of young eruptive stars uh, began uh, well before Lee Hartman was born or where any of you were probably born. So it happened in 1936 that a star called F.U. Orionis went into outburst. You can see in the light curve that it became brighter by five or, or six magnitudes very, very suddenly. And then surprisingly, it stayed bright for many, many decades. And for many, many decades, it was the only known such star until about 1969, when another star with 1057 Cygni went into outburst. And with two objects, you can already make a class. And that's what in 1971, Victor Ambarzumian did. He coined this abbreviation FUOR for the two objects known at that time, FUORI and V1057 Cygni. Only a couple of years later in 1975, during a conference, Bogdan Paczynski uh, already suggested that instabilities in a circumstellar disk, uh, accretion disk, can be a possible explanation for fewer outbursts. I want to emphasize how remarkable this is because uh, you may remember from uh, Nuria's uh, uh, talk, for example, on Tuesday, that at that time there were still uh, heated debates uh, about whether uh, Titori stars have accretion disks or not. And uh, famous Linda Mellon Pringle paper only appeared in 74. So uh, that was really an early um, uh, realization of. of uh, uh, what became a very, very important field. 
uh, in the following uh, decades, in the 70s and 80s, uh, many more fewers were discovered and many more evidences uh, were gathered uh, for the enhanced disk accretion model. And in 85, the Hartman and Scott Cannon uh, published a nice paper on the nature of FERNS objects, where they basically summarize this idea that you have a, a disk, an accretion disk, that normally accretes at a low level, let's say 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 7 solar masses per year, but it gets uh, replenishment from an infilling envelope at a, a rate of 10 to the minus five solar masses per year. So you accumulate a lot of material, it becomes unstable somehow, and then uh, the accretion rate to the star quickly uh, rises uh, to, let's say, 10 to the minus four solar masses per year, and it stays elevated until the inner disk depletes. So this is what probably happened for, for Fiori, which uh, brightened and then stayed uh, bright for, for several decades. Um, in the meanwhile, other types of young stars were also observed to display eruptions. And these turned out to be much shorter and repetitive in nature. And um, for these objects, uh, in 1989, George Herbig introduced uh, the abbreviation XOR, which are named after the prototype EX Lupi, but to rhyme with fewer, he named them XORs. We can keep them calling EX Lupi type objects so as not to confuse them with uh, EX Ori, which is another type of variable star, an AGB star, actually. So I'm, uh, I know it's confusing, <laughs> and I'm not going to go into the utility or futility of classifying young, young eruptive stars. But um, what I want to uh, tell you or draw your attention to is that we try to dispel this confusion. Uh, and there is now a very uh, nice series of, of review papers that you can uh, uh, learn more, much more about the uh, young uh, eruptive stars, starting with the famous uh, 96 annual review of astronomy, astrophysics paper of Lee Hartman and Scott Kenyon. And then in 2000, there was a, a review by Karen Bell and collaborators in Protostars and Planets 4. And then in uh, 2014, uh, we published a review in PP6 uh, with Mark Odard. And then next year, there will be another uh, review in PP7 uh, led by Will Fisher. So as you can assume uh, or imagine, there is a lot of new uh, uh, observations, you know, new information theory as well in these papers. And what uh, I want to um, highlight or, or um, show uh, how, how much progress there has been since, since uh, Lisa's uh, 96 paper is that, uh, so I, I copied here the, the light curves of the three classical fjords uh, available at that time. Uh, and I complemented these light curves with new observations. So brace yourselves, you will be very surprised. This is what the light curves look like now. So if you look at the Top one, V1057 Cygni, did something very curious in, in 1995. And if you are curious about that, um, uh, check out the recent paper of my student, Trofia Sabo. We are also studying the 1515 Cygni, which uh, apparently almost went back to quiescence by now, um, perhaps the first bona fide of you are to do so. And the bottom one, FU Ori, is still going strong. It only faded a little bit. Um, and uh, what is curious about this one is that uh, if you imagine that this object is accreting at a rate of 10 to the minus four solar masses per year, you can see on the light curve that it has been doing that for almost 100 years. So if, if you integrate the accretion rate curve, you will get the accreted mass since this star, uh, so, so that the mass that this star collected since 1936 is about 10 to the minus two solar masses or 10 Jupiter masses, amazing. So I'm not gonna talk more about light curves. Uh, if you are interested in those or the spectroscopy of these objects, um, you can listen to the talk uh, after me uh, by Philip Lucas or uh, Lynn Hillenbrand. There are also many uh, excellent uh, posters like uh, those by Marco Dard, uh, Jan Guo, uh, Evian Semkov, or my colleague Michal Siva. So what I'm gonna focus on is the following aspect. So we know that young reactive star in young reactive stars accretion rate increases by several orders of magnitude up to 10 to the minus four solar masses per year. And then of course the bolometric luminosity of these objects increase from a few solar luminosities to a few 10 or a few hundred solar luminosities. So what you can observe on the light curves is a brightening by three to five magnitudes, both at optical and infrared wavelengths. And then uh, on the lower left, I'm showing you how uh, such an eruption may um, also illuminate the uh, scattered light reflection nebula around uh, such a young star. And to put this uh, large brightening into context, for comparison, the change in total solar irradiance 
is less than two millimagnitude. And even regular titrary variability is only about 0.1 or one magnitude. So uh, three to five magnitudes is, is a lot and it must have a substantial effect on the circumstellar environment. But how do outbursts affect uh, different properties of the disk? Can they affect the structure, mineralogy, or chemistry uh, of the disk? As I mentioned, uh, a star may collect as much as 10 Jupiter masses in a single fewer type outburst. So outbursting disks must be very large and very massive, right? With in pro probably interesting substructures, hopefully. But do observations come from this? And why do young stars, or more precisely their disks, erupt at all? Do they become um, unstable in a viscous thermal way, or gravitational or magnet rotational way? Are they perturbed by a substellar or stellar companion? Or do they capture a cloudlet or collide with a streamer? And how do they finish their outbursts? And how, they are how are they replenished uh, afterwards for a repeat performance? The most important question of all, do all young sun-like stars go through these eruptive phases? To answer this question, we need to study whether the disks of uh, young eruptive stars are in any way different uh, from the uh, general population of disks. But uh, let me stop here for a moment and acknowledge the fact that not only uh, low mass young stars show eruptions, uh, high mass young stars also show accretion re related outbursts. And uh, if you are interested in those, check out the posters of Vardan Erbakian or Alceo Caretto Garatti. But at the moment, I will focus on the uh, sun-like stars, uh, starting with the effect of the outburst on the disk and the circumstellar environment in general. So what do we expect about the structure changes? If we look at the immediate vicinity of the stars, so um, and the closest environment, uh, we expect dust evaporation, increase in the dust sublimation radius, and perhaps recondensation afterwards. If you look at the broader environment, um, larger spatial scales and also longer time scales, uh, we may expect that during the uh, increased uh, accretion, also the uh, mass outflow is increased, and then you carve larger and larger um, cavity into uh, the surrounding envelope. And for a while, there may be some uh, material to replenish it um, and, and to start the cycle again, but um, eventually you deplete your uh, envelope. And according to this picture, uh, repeated eruptions may actually be the, uh, the thing that makes um, a protostar optically visible. So do the observations come from this? Well, to study the uh, smaller spatial scales, we need to use, for example, infrared interferometry with instruments like the VLTI. And we did that uh, for the outburst of V1647 Orionis, where we indeed um, detected uh, noticeable changes in the inner radius of the distant envelope uh, during the outburst, which seemed to be larger during the outburst than, than in quiescence. So there will be more about uh, interferometric observations, specifically VLTI and MATIS in the talk of my colleague Peter Abraham. And uh, there's also a very nice poster by my colleague Fotani Liku uh, showing MATIS observations of FU Orionis. If we look at uh, larger spatial scales and the scales of the envelopes and, and outflows, we can use molecular line studies, and you can use NOIMA or ALMA for high spatial resolution studies and single dish observations like the IRAM 30 meter telescope or the APEX for low spatial resolution. Um, observations of young eruptive stars show a wide variety of uh, structures, starting from, um, so here you can see CO observations, the red shifted and blue shifted uh, sides of, of CO outflows. And uh, for V346 normally, what you see is um, a very uh, large 10,000 AU scale outflow with very narrow opening angle. And then for HVC494, you see a much wider uh, opening angle for the outflow cavity on a few thousand AU scale. And for VX to be, uh, that's basically a disk only source uh, with a, a disk mostly in Keplerian rotation on a 100 AU scale. So these studies are less about um, changes in individual objects, but more like uh, they, they possibly outline a kind of an evolution from the younger, more embedded objects or the less embedded, more evolved objects. Um, and in this evolution, outbursts and, and jets and outflows in general may play an important role. So if you want to learn more about that, there is a poster by my colleague Song Kyung Park about a very peculiar young raptive star with nine, uh, 8991 and about uh, the accretion ejection link, check out Jessica Erkal's poster. 
So we can study at high resolution some individual objects for lower, if you use lower resolution, we can survey larger samples. And that's what we did for a few hours with Apex. Here again, I'm showing red shifted, blue shifted sides of, of CO outflows. And we found that about half of them drive molecular outflows, including some very massive and energetic cases. Uh, the histograms show the mass distribution, force distribution of outflows with black and the few hours and colors and other samples. And what is really interesting in this study is that if you compare, I mean, you can use the CO emission towards a systemic velocity to estimate the ma uh, mass of the envelope. And that correlates very well with the appearance of the 10 micron silicate feature. Uh, objects with a large envelope mass uh, show the silicate feature in absorption. Objects with low envelope mass show the silicate feature in, in emission. So this seems to re reinforce this idea that uh, in uh, uh, the um, uh, younger objects have the, uh, are more embedded, have large envelope, mass, more massive envelopes and silicate feature and absorption, and then uh, uh, more evolved objects have more tenuous envelopes and you have a direct view onto the disk surface where you, you see silicate emission. Um, what about chemical changes? Outbursts may move the snow line or induce interesting chemical changes that would not happen if there were no outbursts. For example, in eight, uh, we ate 883 Ori, which has an outburst luminosity of 400 solar luminosities. We know that the water snow line is at 42 AU, whereas in a non-outbursting source, that would be at about one to five AU. So that's a large change uh, when, when the disk goes into eruption. So what, do we, what changes do we expect? There are now several time-dependent chemical uh, models that suggest important changes in the molecular ice and gas phase abundances. Here I'm showing one example by Tamara Moyerova. Uh, you can see on the uh, upper left, uh, the luminosity curve of a generic uh, fewer outburst that lasted for 50 years. And then below that, I'm showing the formaldehyde abundance um, as a function of time for different model parameters. And for one of the models in the bottom le left, I'm showing the, uh, again, formaldehyde abundance throughout the disk in the gas phase and in the ice phase at the peak of the outburst. You can see that almost all of the uh, formaldehyde was uh, in the gas phase and none, practically none was left in the ice. You can do this kind of calculations for any type of molecules, uh, uh, complex organic molecules. And uh, in the center of the bar graph uh, shows the um, uh, abundances of different molecules before, during, and after the outburst, both in the gas phase and in the ice phase. So can we really um, measure these abundances? With ALMA, it's now possible. Here I'm showing the ALMA uh, line observations of the two fewer type young eruptive stars, V883 ORI and HARO 5A IRS. You don't need to see the details. Uh, what I want to show here is that these spectra are full of lines, and each line can be identified uh, with a uh, different uh, complex organic molecule. Uh, I'm, I'm listed the identified molecules in the two targets. We know from astrochemical studies that complex organic molecules form in the ice phase. And they are observable in fewers in the gas phase because they were heated and sublimated by the outburst. The fewers can essentially be used as astrochemical laboratories. And one uh, very nice such laboratory is a star called uh, 1550 IRS-5. It's actually a, a binary in, in Taurus. 51A separation binary. Here I'm showing the ALMA observations, uh, uh, integrated line intensities for different molecules. And you can see that the northern source is always brighter, the southern one is always uh, fainter. And that's because the northern source in this binary is in outburst, and the southern one is not. So uh, the northern source actually shows a hot coronal like chemistry. This object is actually very, very interesting, very well studied, well known object. So, if you want to learn more about that, uh, there are two posters one by Anton Finney Johansson and one by Young, Young about F1550 and RS5 uh, from different aspects. So, I talked about molecular ices, uh, um, gas phase molecules, but about the uh, solid material, the solid dust grains, what happens to them? Well, that's an interesting question because we know that the ISM have, uh, has um, small amorphous dust grains. We know that if we look towards the galactic center, where there is a lot of dust in our line of sight. We also know that in solar system comets, uh, comets have a very high um, crystallinity fraction. So how did it happen that the amorphous dust was trans transformed into crystalline? There's a process called thermal annealing that happens uh, between 1000 and 1500 K. You need to heat the dust to this exact temperature range to transform from uh, the grains from amorphous to uh, crystalline. 
So can we see this in young reactive stars? Well, there is at least one star where we uh, saw this, and that's EX Lupi, the prototype of the XOR class. This star went into a very large, uh, very powerful eruption in uh, 2008, and with Spitzer uh, infrared spectra, we detected during the outburst these peaks and shoulders that are characteristic of crystalline force ride. Uh, while before the outburst, uh, the feature was completely amorphous. So we uh, interpreted this change uh, in the silicate feature by the appearance of crystalline silicates due to annealing uh, crystallization on the disk surface due to the uh, heat of the outburst. Ongoing uh, spectroscopic monitoring revealed that the crystals that were created in the outburst later became more tenuous and colder, probably because they were being transported to uh, more far away colder uh, disk uh, parts. And uh, now what we want to check is whether these crystals could reach the snow line in the XOP system. Uh, for that, we need very, very sensitive uh, uh, observations uh, to, to uh, detect the very faint uh, uh, signal of, of these cold crystals. And that's now possible thanks to the James Webb Space Telescope, for which we have an accepted uh, proposal to measure EX looping. What about fjords? Are there minergical changes or crystalline silicates there? Well, so far we haven't seen any. Uh, all the fjords uh, uh, we measured with, with, with Spitzer and, and Vizier and, uh, and MIDI uh, uh, display uh, basically large amorphous grains. Uh, you can characterize the 10 micron silicate feature by its strength and the flux ratio between 11.3 and 9.8 micron, which basically tells you whether it, if it's a triangular or, or trapezoidal. And if you uh, plot uh, your objects on this uh, strength uh, flux ratio graph, you will see that all the fjords are in the lower, uh, in the upper left uh, part, where you can reach if you have significant grain growth. Whereas if you compare those to a uh, normal titori stars with, with the gray dots, those display anything from pristine small uh, dust grains to significant grain growth. So fjords are different in, in this respect, and we still don't really understand why. Um, so let's move on to different properties of, of outbursting disks. I mentioned at the beginning that there is this expectation that these disks must be massive because there, you need a lot of uh, mass to, to keep up the outbursts. So if you want to measure disk masses, you need to measure them in the millimeter because that's where uh, dust is not so optically thick. So that's what we did with SMA for uh, 29 young reactive stars at one millimeter. We detected 21 of them. And the cumulative distribution uh, basically shows that eruptive stars are, uh, show systematically higher millimeter luminosities than, for example, class two young uh, stellar objects. We saw some hints for millimeter uh, flux variability. Greg also mentioned this phenomenon before me. And uh, what we also saw is that binaries in multiple systems are systematically fainter than the rest of the sample. And binaries are a whole different uh, story. If you're interested in, in accretion in binaries, there are two posters about that, one by Regica Kruvita and uh, another one by my colleague Anna Fireno. Uh, these uh, objects are very close binaries showing pulse accretion. So it's a different phenomenon. Let's, let's stay with the eruptive stars now. Disks may be optically thick even at millimeter wavelengths. So to properly trace their masses, you need to uh, spatially resolve them and model them with the radiative transfer that uh, properly takes into account optical depth effects uh, with ray tracing. And that's what we did with ALMA for a sample of 10 uh, few hours, some of uh, which I'm showing here. So these are the 1.3 millimeter continuum emission from these disks. And our modeling provided disk masses and characteristic disk radii for our sample. We complemented our sample with, uh, with fewers from the literature and, and class two and class one disks from the literature measured and modeled in the same way as we did for our sample. And what you can see here is that fewers uh, typically have um, uh, larger masses and smaller sizes. Uh, so they are more, ma uh, more massive and more compact than, than uh, the general population of disks. So what does this mean? This means that either um, fjords are different to begin with, or somehow the outburst makes them, makes them special. If you know the stellar mass and the disk mass, we can also check whether this uh, may be gravitationally unstable. Um, so uh, that's an important issue because gravitational instability is one of the mechanisms that people uh, mention as a, as a possible trigger for the outburst. 
So there are multiple ways to check this. Uh, the easiest one being that if your um, disk is more massive than 10% of your central star, then your disk may be gravitationally unstable. And for our sample, uh, most of uh, this, the fewer disks satisfy this criterion. It's still an open question whether we should see gravitational, uh, gravitational fragments or, or spiral structure in these disks. There are uh, simulations like those by Robin Dong, uh, which predict that, that in these cases we should see this, uh, these structures. Uh, other simulations by uh, Edward Vorobia, for example, predict that um, the heat of the outburst actually and the expansion of the disk will smear out these structures. But maybe it's just that our observations were not sensitive enough or, or the, the spatial resolution was not high enough to detect these. Unfortunately, most of the fjords are quite distant. So um, uh, another interesting uh, thing I want to highlight on this graph is the, the left side. There are a couple of fewer disks which are re uh, remarkably low mass. Their masses are actually comparable to the total mass uh, created in one single outburst. So it's a question how this can erupt. Um, it, are we just lucky, so lucky that we witness the last eruption that these disks can produce, or maybe they will be replenished later. I mean, replenishment is not something that it can easily be observed, but there is one object where we managed to measure it, and that's V346 Norme. Uh, these are ALMA uh, uh, CO line observation, 13 CO, C18, not towards the center of this source, and you see that it has a double peak, uh, which uh, indicates rotation. If we measure very precisely the rotational uh, velocity as a function of distance from the star, you will see that the central part of this system uh, has a Keplerian disk, and the outer part is subcaplarian. It follows um, a law which uh, characterizes pseudo disks. So pseudo disks are structures that ha have um, a combination of infall and um, uh, rotation. And for these, for this specific kind of uh, velocity profile, you can uh, analytically calculate the infall rate. And for this star, we got a number, six times 10 to the minus six solar masses per year, which is an, more than an order of magnitude higher than the quiescent accretion rate in, the, in this system. What does this mean? It means that this system, that the disk receives more material uh, uh, from the outside than what it can normally dump onto the star at the center. <laughs> So this may re, uh, lead to pileup and accretion burst. So this may not be a general explanation uh, for, for all fjords, but at least this uh, mismatch, uh, this is actually the first uh, observational evidence for such a mismatch between the envelope to disk info rate and the disk to uh, star accretion rate in, in an eruptive star. This may explain why this specific star uh, shows eruptions. Uh, so with that, I would like to summarize my uh, my talk. So I was talking about fjords, exors, uh, young stellar objects exhibiting uh, powerful accretion-related outbursts. These eruptions uh, may um, constitute a so far largely overlooked but potentially very important phase of the formation of sun-like stars. And what is important or interesting is that these overlap with uh, in time with planet formation. I showed results from our extensive research program. We characterize these uh, objects at different wavelengths, different spatial resolutions to build a full picture. And our latest results suggest that the disks, uh, at least of fewers, uh, might be special. Uh, there is probably no single theory that explains all, all of the outbursts. And uh, another interesting aspect, I think, is that if you could confront the results of young, young gravitational stars with solar system evidences on temporary flux rises of the early sun, for example, for meteorites, this may provide uh, important constraints both for the solar system formation and for, for the understanding of young gravitational stars. So obviously more observations and more modeling are needed. And as a closing remark, I, I want to mention that uh, the, this 96 review by, by Lee Hartman and Scott Kenyon was really, really important and influential for, for my career. And, and I hope that, that my papers and, and uh, the reviews I'm participating in will, will inspire new generation of astronomers to, to study uh, the eruptive phenomenon. It's a, it's a fascinating topic. Thank you very much. Questions? Lee. So uh, when do you think uh, V1515 may fade enough that we can see 
uh, the spectrum of the central star? Um, that's a good question. So as if I remember the, the light curve, it is maybe a magnitude or two higher than the quiescence. Um, we are actually, we just have an accepted proposal to, to obtain a, an infrared spectrum for it. So hopefully in a few weeks, we will get a, a new spectrum for it and, and we will see. Um, so far, I haven't, I, I'm not aware of any fjords that really went back to quiescence so much that, that it became again, a t Tauri star. I would love to see that, <laughs> but, um. Uh, but but I would think that that I would I would try doing it in the optical at high spectral resolution. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that for that we would need a very large telescope and a lot of time. <laughs> so if if the if the you infrared must, you, is, must, you must know people. <laughs> if if our I, I infrared can, I can, spectrum, I, yes. I can think of somebody at Caltech, for instance. <laughs> yeah. So if our infrared <laughs> spectrum turns out to be promising, then then we will probably try uh, an optical one as well. So you mentioned this is, um, you mentioned that about half of the uh, fewers you looked at had molecular outflows. What about the other half? Are they just do you have an explanation for why they don't or like is it just sensitivity or was there is there actually like a missing envelope or something else? So what we basically see is that they have a very narrow uh, CO line, so no uh, broad line wings, uh, no uh, no outflow basically in the right shifted blue shifted side um so i can think of many things i mean i mean of course outflow uh, so to drive an outflow that that's a complicated process uh, you need magnetic field you need the disk and uh, we don't really know what goes on at the center of a, of a fjord uh, whether its magnetic field is completely quenched or, or still there or, or what happens um another issue that makes the interpretation of these results complicated is that uh, whenever we see an outflow of course uh, its dynamical um, age is is much longer much larger than um, than uh, the the current outburst so outbursting sources are known to um, be in outburst for for a couple of decades and and then outflows which are 10,000 uh, AU long are several thousands or 10,000 of, of years uh, old, at least the, 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 the largest parts. So they might have been started being driven when during a previous outburst or something like that. So, um, so, so, so the fact that the, this dichotomy may actually uh, mean um, that then maybe um, you need time to, to develop um, uh, an outflow. So if, if your source is in outburst now, that doesn't mean that you should see a, a CO outflow, which is several thousands of, uh, of years old. The other thing might be that then maybe this, this uh, suggests that, that, that their internal structure uh, close to the, to the star uh, where, or, or the inner part of the disk where, where you're supposed to start uh, launching the material may actually be different in different objects. Patrick? Thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, I think all of that should be put uh, in the context of the luminosity problem. And uh, I mean, this has not been discussed so far. And uh, to me, this is still a very important issue, in particular because there is a horrible feedback loop um, that needs to be addressed. So I, I, I know those uh, studies, for instance, for instance of uh, this fermentation, and they are beautiful works. but. Uh, if you would take into account the feedback from the central star, so the minute you will heat up the, the disk very severely, actually, and you may actually suppress fragmentations until you kill <laughs> the, the burst and so on. So it, it's a difficult problem. Huh? Um, and also, uh, when you consider, um, when you set up uh, disks which are gravitationally unstable, say, as an initial conditions, of course, there is a question of where did it come from, uh, because a gravitational disk will quickly because it's unstable, uh, regulate its own mass, and, and therefore, in like few dynamical time, disappear. So it means, as you said in your talk, that you should have some accretions to sustain it. Uh, and so there is a question of the envelope and so on. So, yeah, generally speaking, how does it goes with the accretion with the problem? This 
this, do you think you, got, you can solve it or, or? So this, this uh, so the uh, episodic accretion has, has been invoked as a possible solution for the uh, luminosity problem uh, for, for several years, uh, or decade or so. And um, yeah, I mean, I like this argument because I can always start my proposals with mentioning this to, you know, <laughs> give a, a more importance to a group of objects with, of which we only know a couple of dozen. So statistics are, are still very, very low although it's improving now with Gaia and another all sky surveys that keep discovering uh, uh, in bright brightenings of, of young stars. So, uh, so hopefully we can in, uh, improve um, statistics in, in the future, which, which will help us um, judge how, how prevalent uh, the, the episodic accretion uh, is uh, concerning um, statist uh, general statistics uh, in, in specific star formations or in the whole sky uh, in general. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, I'm no expert in, in the luminosity of, of YSOs in general, but there has been other um, um, issues mentioned that, that basically, basically solved the, the problem. It, it, some people argue that uh, we shouldn't call it a problem. It's, it's not a problem at all. What, what we basically see is a, a large spread of, of luminosities, uh, but, but basically there, there can be uh, various explanations why, why we see that, and, uh, and it's, it's not a problem in a sense. Okay, we also have a, sorry. <clears throat> we also have a question from Slack, from Tyler Burke. If you want to unmute. Sure. sure. Um, thanks for the great talk, Agnes. I was curious to know if you have any comment on um, how FURE disk may look like before a burst or just before a burst. Um, I was wondering if there's any agreement between any of the modeling on, on that aspect and whether we could identify any potential FUREs through any observations at all. Well, that's a great question. I, I would love to identify them just before they, they go off. Uh, actually, so recent light curves um, indicated some, some intriguing phenomena. Like in some cases, we saw that uh, after a quiescent level, some objects increase by like one magnitude or so, or just a little bit. They stay like that for a while, and then they produce the outburst. So that might be an indication. Um, also, there are objects where we see that they start brightening earlier in the infrared than in the optical, which probably tells us something about the disk structure, the pileup of the material, or, the, or how the, the ionization front uh, starts developing. Uh, but these are, yeah, very, very indirect uh, evidences. I mean, we only have light curves if we are lucky um, uh, with good cadence, uh, multi-filter observations if we are lucky, but most of the time we don't have these. And and uh, what would be really nice if, if we find an object which uh, for which we could have uh, spatially resolved observations, interferometric observations before, during, and after the outburst, so that that would teach us a lot, but at the moment, I think there there are no no such luck with with any of the observe uh, objects we know. Compact massive disks. That's yeah. That that actually that's a, that's a good indication. So so our studies show that that these disks are. Are massive and compact, and then there is a very detailed study uh, on the structure of the FURE disk itself, and there are indications that there is really a lot of material hidden in the very central part. So if we find such objects, then then that might be an indication. I, I certainly hope there's a lot of mass in because <laughs> a lot of it. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. Yeah, well, a lot of it's fallen in, right? So hopefully, there's something left. <laughs> very last question from Nuria. But uh, uh, the FURNs have very different light curves. And have you found any correlation with one of the properties, uh, the, these properties, outflows, chemical, something that tells them apart? Hmm, that's a good question. I haven't really thought about that. Well, the, the, there are not so many objects with vast sample light curves and well-known properties to, to conveniently bin them into 
different categories to, to try to find correlations. So any, anything we find would be, you know, uh, very tentative, but I think it's, it's, it would be interesting to check. Curves and you can compare their this, uh, you know, like the properties in general to see if you see a system a difference. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that's certainly worth trying. Thank you. Okay, okay. Let's thank again uh, Agnes. Thank you. Um, there are also more questions on Slack if you want to go on yeah. Agnes later and answer yes. them. Now, next speaker is uh, Phil Lucas from University of Hertfordshire. The title of the talk is uh, the long, the short, and the tall. The four exhort transition in class one YSOs. Okay, thanks. For... Please, Phil. Yeah, thanks, Alessio. And uh, thanks again uh, to the organizers uh, for giving me the chance to speak here. So, um, this title I've ripped off from a, a war movie that I half remember from my early childhood. It had a different name in America, but hopefully, it gives you the flavor of. Uh, sort of general sort of thing that I'm talking about in terms of what we see in terms of long outbursts, short outbursts, and big outbursts, as well as little ones. Um, it had a, a star cast and a low budget made in a studio not far away from my university. Um, and that gives me an excuse to mention my own star cast. I also have a low budget, but I have three very talented young scientists on the top row there who are, have been helping me with all of this. More than half of the recent results that I'm gonna show are from Jen Guo, um, who's been doing some fantastic work um, that's building on Carlos Contreras Pena's PhD thesis work, which was also fantastic. And he's, uh, they've been just, you know, working very well together and following on from each other. And all of us, well, not Carlos, but Jen, and recently Carlos and myself have been benefiting hugely from Lee Smith, who, who doesn't work in star formation, but did build a database, which we're trying to release to the public. Um, CDS wants one, light curve, one file per light curve, that's 700 million files. So we need to have that discussion about that. But, you know, um, that's made things easier. Okay, um, yes. <laughs> um, so quick outline, I will have to go fairly fast, give simple facts. Uh, I'll say a little bit about what we did know, of the survey that we're using, which is uh, the VVV survey on Vista, and uh, the database is called Virac2 that Lee has made. Uh, recent results and a quick summary. And I'm going to take a minute or two, if I have time, to advertise Jen Guo's poster, which has uh, done very exciting things on binary stars. I think there's a number of people here who work on binary stars, and uh, he will have a 90-second poster pitch, but I think it is worth a bit more than that. Okay, so, uh, you know, there are lists in the literature and the review papers that have been mentioned of fewors and XORs and occasional oddball eruptions that don't quite fit these categories. Um, and they've generally been optically discovered, you know, one at a time, which makes it quite difficult to draw statistical conclusions about them. Uh, the few ores have absorption spectra, CO, uh, CO and uh, H2O, and um, they have long outbursts. So this was what was kind of known, high, um, high accretion rates, like 10 to the minus 4. And you often see it said that they have higher amplitude. I read that in papers, but I'm not sure if people really mean that or if they just mean that it has a higher accretion rate and therefore it's a bigger outburst. And so there are some in the list that um, Michael Connolly and Bo Reif were put together that had amplitudes more like two and a half to three mag, but obviously the original ones were more like six mag. So then there's XORs with similar overlapping mag magnitude range. So there was some doubt there. And the XORs, which had emission line spectra, they last sort of a year or two uh, traditionally. Um, Carlos's thesis work was one of the first sort of things to move on for that and say that actually there's an awful lot of things that last a few years ra rather than just one year or a hundred years. Um, and so this is some of what we knew, uh, but we also knew that going back to a paper by Nuria in 1991, that luminous YSOs um, should look a bit more XOR-like in terms of the CO, because if you've got a hot star, it's going to heat the surface of the disk, and therefore, you, you know, you will see the hot surface in, in emission of CO instead of seeing a kind of disk atmosphere showing up in absorption, because you've got that temperature inversion in the surface of the disk. And indeed, Alessio, uh, his paper on a massive eruptive protostar, you see CO emission if you look at it in reflected light and you see that happening. Okay, um, so to refer to Lee's review, which I always go back to to remind myself of, you know, the essentials I need to know on this subject, 
Um, the idea that fuel wars have a long duration and a fast rise here was largely built on two of those three objects with a six mag amplitude. And the third one was different, but those two objects have kind of colored the theoretical approach. A lot of theorists have said, we need to explain a fast rise and a long duration here. Now, um, this is our survey. We are, we're using the VISTA telescope on Paranal. We'll kind of skate over this. This is our enormous area uh, mostly talking about the little blue area, which is the original VVV survey, which has almost 10 years of data and is largely finished. The surrounding VVVX survey is, uh, has about another year to run, and we have less data there, but it's uh, working to, uh, we haven't really looked very much at that yet because there's so much to do essentially. Okay. Um, the Vera 2 database I mentioned, built by Lee, has these, uh, just does the original central light blue area, that VVV inner area, but it has 700 million stars. It's got well calibrated photometry, parallaxes, proper motions, which can help out Gaia, where Gaia can't see through the extinction, and good calibration. So I selected everything in that, carefully mining for anything that was real and had more than four mag variation, um, whether it was a variable star or a transient. So I'm trying to write up a paper on all the different things we found. And that had a mixture of YSOs, uh, Novi of some sort, uh, microlenses, LPVs, and a few interesting things like a saccharized star. Lee had a nice paper out on blinking giant stars that giant stars that kind of vanish for six months and come back again. Um, and that's so that's kind of the basis, the YSOs in that set, to some extent, what I'm talking about. Um, so we have earlier samples from Carlos's thesis, which is sort of the one to four mag range. I built another sample out of the public DR4 data, which was sort of three to four mag range. And now we have this other set of higher amplitude YSO, some of which are eruptive and some of which are just like dippers or something a bit funky, but we're not quite sure what the light curve is telling us. Um, but so far, we have something like 57 spectroscopically confirmed eruptive YSOs and various other things which we're not sure about, or they're dippers or something else, and about 15 fuels in that list. So that's starting to get the sort of numbers where we can do statistics of things we know are eruptive YSOs. So uh, here's some nice spectra. Um, we got nine recently this year of these sort of you know, high amplitude uh, fuel types. So you can see very nice, clear high amplitude light curves, sort of classical FU ORI spectra with the CO absorption on the right hand side there and the water absorption peaks that you get in the near infrared. You'll notice that these are all these tall outbursts as it are, are long. So they're, they're tall and they're long. Um, in most cases, they have a slow rise. So it's typically taking two or three years for the outburst to rise. There's an exception at the lower left there where it was quicker and a bit more like FU Ori, but the general rule is it takes a long time to go up and it stays bright for a long time. Uh, here's a couple more just to show that um, the highest amplitude one was actually on the left, but it did start fading fairly quickly as these things go. And so you can see the CO absorption in 2019 at the upper left there, but by 2020-21, it had got, it's still there, but it got pretty faint and hard to see. Um, and the one on the top right, it's just, it's, it, the CO is visible, but again, it weakened between the two spectra as the thing faded out. And so that's basically as the, as the, as the source fades, the vertical temperature gradients in the disk are just getting weaker. And what happens if you look at the one on the, on the left, the very high amplitude one, um, the CO gets cooler, okay? And so you won't always see these strong CO band, head, uh, band heads because when the CO temperature is lower, um, the, you know, the, atomic energy levels or molecular energy levels involved in the band head have less electrons in those levels because the temperature has dropped. Um, the other lines in the band head that you can see are still a bit stronger and a bit easier to see, but it's harder to see sometimes as the temperature drops. So you won't always see that classic CO signature in some of the cooler things. And this was pointed out actually by uh, uh, Lee actually in a paper in uh, 2004 on V1057 SIG. Uh, he saw this 620K. He didn't actually show a nice picture of it that allowed me to see that I could show you, but he was actually saying that this came from a blue shifted ejected shell causing the absorption rather than the disc. So we shouldn't get too locked in on the idea that we're always seeing a disc. There can be other things. Okay, um, so this is from uh, Jen's paper this year on what we found up to the start of this year below four magnitudes in amplitude. Uh, so we had 40 plus eruptive YSOs below four mag. And the surprise here is that these are mostly XORs. XORs dominate below four mag. Even in the long duration end, the circles of the XORs, the stars, there's not very many stars here. There's six of them, and those are the few ors. So even at the, lo the long durations, the, the, um, it's not few ors, it's XORs. And there are also a couple of low amplitude, sort of below two mag few ors there. The red one, one in red has some extinction 
variation as well, but we've got two of them sort of between one and a half mag and two mag there. Um, they all have a minimum duration of five years in total, although we did get one where the peak is about two years and it lasts at least five. Um, XORs can have any kind of duration from months to 10 years, but the shorter end we get these things that Jen called uh, multiple timescale events. So you get, you know, mostly lower amplitude, but you get a lot of up and down on the time scale of a few weeks or months, uh, but you also get something on a one to two year time scale. And you see these fairly fast spectroscopic changes there as well. And if I have time, we'll talk about the periodic stuff as well, because there's some of those that we started to see. Now this year we've got the higher amplitude sample. So um, we've delayed by COVID for a year, but we finally got the X shooter spectra. Most of these things had not faded out. Thank goodness, <laughs> you know, you can imagine how nervous you get when your observations get delayed by a year in this game. Uh, but over four mag, um, I, I selected a bunch of things that majority of them have this sort of classic simple monotonic rise. They're fairly simple light curves. And over four mag, they're blue here, they're the fewers. Uh, there's one exception that was an XOR. Below four mag, it's more often XORs. So there is a clear sort of change there as you go above four mag. Uh, one object or two objects, you just see an outflow that may be too deeply embedded. So you can't always tell, or uh, they may have just faded out. I will point out an exception to that. Um, Greg was kind enough to mention I had something exciting in WISE to mention. So I did find a, 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 uh, an outburst which would be off the top of this plot because it erupts by eight magnitudes in WISE. Um, that happened, peaked around 2010 and mostly faded away by the time we got a spectrum. Um, but it was essentially a sort of 800 Kelvin event, uh, emission region, reprocessed lights emitting on about a four and a half to five AU spatial scale. And the spectrum was very steep. So I think even if we did have a spectrum at the peak, we'd be looking at sufficiently cool matter that you would struggle to see the CO. And there was another one found, WISE 0759, with about a seven mag amplitude, was found by a citizen scientist a few months later called Marina Thaveno. And we did get a spectrum of that one at the start of the year. I asked Jay, Jay Elias and Cesar Procenio to do that. And they tell me it was featureless. So sometimes these things are too deeply embedded and you simply can't see the classic fuel stuff. So don't get too locked in on, you know, what someone's definition of what's a spectroscopic fuel or not. Okay, um, typically long durations, sort of 10 plus years, we think most of the time, but there's bound to be exceptions. Uh, the rise times, this is a bit of an old plot, but yeah, the rise times, you've got a big cloud of things which are two or three years, and that's basically all I wanted to say there. Uh, we weren't seeing periodic variability in this high amplitude sample. So over four mag, we don't see periodic stuff. Below four mag, we do. Um, now, the, as to go back on, I think Nuria was asking, um, you can't really tell from the light curves whether it's going to be a few or an X or you, you can tell from the amplitudes to some extent, but not even always then. But at lower amplitude, you really can't tell. You can have similar things, and one is going to be a few or one's going to be an XOR. Uh, the one on the right, you've got a really long, slow rise there, but you know, it's just difficult to tell. Uh, so the XORs look like the thing on the bottom left where you've got the emission lines. Okay, um, they did, there is variety. Um, so this was the shortest fuel at the lowest lower left there. That was V322, is a fuel with a peak of about two years and a duration of five years. One of these multiple timescale variables I mentioned that um, Jen was discovering and making a, quite, a, quite an interesting find in his, last, his previous paper. Um, this is the most dramatic one where you've got something like three mags of variability in a few weeks or so. Uh, so the dominant timescale is typically less than a year or two there. Um, but there was, a, there was a longer slow trend there as it goes from lower left to upper right. It's funny, when you actually look at this in WISE, that particular object, you don't see any of the funky short time scale variation. You just see the slow trend because WISE samples every six months and it completely misses the short time scale stuff and you see a nice smooth light curve. Uh, so yeah, there is this, there are these different types of light curves. The one at the upper right has this strange crazy periodic stuff going on. That's an XOR. The one on the top left is a few or we, we don't yet have the numbers as Agnes was saying to really get to grips with, you know, all the different types of light curves and, and eruptions. Uh, okay, so if I have time, I'm gonna go on to Jen's discovery here. I have, okay, uh, so as of, um, you know, start of this year, there were, I think, uh, three clear cases of periodic outbursts that were known. So EC53 that Greg mentioned was found by, by Klaus Hoddap, a 530 day period. Um, Darman Hillenbrand found one um, 2020 V347 Aurigai. That was very exciting because they said that they got um, radial velocities for that one and they proved it wasn't a binary star, that if there is a companion, it's a planet or a low mass brown dwarf because they're not seeing anything above about 25 Jupiter masses there. Um, and yeah, there's a few, in addition, long known 
pulsed accretors. So DQ Tau, I think Agnes mentioned she's working on, uh, was discovered quite a while ago by Matthew and by uh, Kibor Basri worked on that. And there's been a couple of others since. But those are known to be spectroscopic binaries, okay? So they're eccentric spectroscopic binaries where there's something coming in and giving you, modulating the accretion, giving you cyclical accretion. The ones in the, the higher amplitude ones in the upper part of that slide, um, they are not known to be binaries, basically. Um, at least, well, EC53 has a very wide companion, but it's kind of irrelevant. Now, here is what Jen has found. Um, he has actually got about 120 of these suddenly, because he went looking after we found a few. And this was kind of amazing. I was really blown away by this. Um, so he got 60 of these higher amplitude periodic outbursters just by searching the Virac database for everything that's periodic and has small, re small residuals. And then he mined the spicy and Robert Tail lists of YSO candidates, did his best to weed out any Myras. These things were generally already classified as YSOs and found 60 of these lower amplitude pulsed accretors. So these are all reliably periodic. They're not the way he selected them. They're not quasi periodic. You know, it's not crazy. We're not crazy. Um, I was a bit doubtful saying, you know, if you suddenly got 120 of these things and you're saying, are these really YSOs? Have you got spectra? Well, um, we have, I can just come back to that, but we have, we have a very small number of spectra. Here is um, one at the lower left, but they all look like YSOs, or look like XORs, essentially. We have not had a dud that turned out to be something else. And if you look at the light curves there, they have this sort of characteristic peak. Um, they're not sinusoidal, essentially. They have a sharper peak and a, and a get it, quiescent period in between. I flashed up this picture here of... Uh, um, a YSO, sort of an ALMA, ALMA image from Nature by Segura Cox of a class one YSO with gaps and rings. That was a fairly recent paper because we now know from that that there could be planets even at the class one stage because these are mostly class one. Okay, um, you can look at Jen's poster for these details. One fascinating fact about this stuff, mo some of them are symmetric, some are, some are fast rise, slow decline, easy enough to understand. We have some with negative skew where there's a slow rise and then it cuts off fun fast. That's really interesting physics, and I don't pretend to understand what's going on there, but okay. So I'm going to kind of finish off here because I'm out of time. Uh, look out for Carlos's paper on uh, Spitzer selected uh, VVV YSOs, so the incidence of YSOs. He's doing the short, the medium, the long in terms of how often we see those. Paper just accepted yesterday. It might even be on archive now. Thomas Molnar's two million periodic variables, um, machine learning classifications. There's a ton you can do with two million classified RLREs and Cepheids and Eclipse and binaries and everything else. The release papers, I'll thank the supporting, you know, the SOC, the LOC, all of the stars who gave us this talk. Um, and I'll leave up the summary slide there uh, for you to look at. I've kind of highlighted there um, in, um, in blue were the things that we didn't really know. Some of the other things we kind of sort of half suspected or knew, like the duration being at least five years on the few hours, but the blue things are kind of the surprises um, as well as Jen's item in red there. Uh, thanks. Questions? Me. So I find the, the slower rise time uh, interesting and I'm just wondering, you know, the, the, this may not work out, but, but uh, if, if you have a, like an outside in uh, burst, then the infrared, I think, uh, that dominates the K-band will come from a larger radius range than what the optical would be. Right. And so I could imagine that if we had optical data that you might have seen uh, the optical burst come a little later and be a little faster. Just, yeah. Just because you're, you're, you're propagating through a, a, a small... Uh, a smaller radial range. Yeah, the I, 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 we don't tend to have optical data because these things are obviously deeply embedded. But I did ask Jen to have a little look at comparing the wise light curves. I mean, he always looks at the wise light curves as well as the um, as well as the VVV light curves, and he did that comparison. Obviously, although you know, wise only samples every six months, so you're not going to notice if it's one month before in the. But he didn't see in most cases a clear difference in the time scale. There's nothing very dramatic between 4.6 microns and 2.2, for example. But yeah. Could could you see any uh, delay between or no? Or so we're not, it, we were not we were we were not really seeing a delay that's noticeable on the time scale of months between those things. It wasn't obviously there. One thing I would mention that 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 eight mag outburst I found in Wise, which was a fairly large thing, um, in terms of radius, 
um, that had uh, you know, a tendency that we thought it might be propagating outward because it actually got brighter as it got redder, which I interpreted as just increased surface area. So I know though that the one that uh, Carlos and uh, Carlos Contreras and Lynn Hillenbrand wrote up from Gaia that seemed to be going inward because it erupted in the mid infrared first and then in the optical. Whereas in this case we seem to be the other way. And you know I'm, I'm not a theorist, but I'm aware that in some of the theoretical models you can get things offer, you know, uh, accretion instability can propagate inward and outward, and it just depends on what you see, right? So. So now that you're getting pretty reasonable numbers of these uh, that spread throughout the galactic plane, are you able to say anything about overall population statistics? Like how how often are uh, these, or say class one objects, pure versus XORs? Or is that uh, still too hard to do? Well, I mean, for what I was, one of the results there is that the few ores right are the high amplitude ones by and large. I mean, we do get them at lower amplitudes, but they're rare there. And so Carlos is writing up the paper on the incidence in amongst class one YSOs of all of these different types of, vari of eruptions. Anything above two mag, he's slicing it down into short, medium, and long outbursts mm -hmm. and saying, this is how, this is, how, this is the incidence that they, that they are. This is what fraction of YSOs that you get in a spits of selected YSO candidate list that that happens. So that's going to be helpful. He, he's, you know, several different ways of defining a class one. He's looked at all of that because I asked him to be careful, um, you know, and so, yeah, hopefully we'll have some numbers there that will begin to be useful. Um, Thank you. Yeah, with, uh, with regard to Lee's uh, question, uh, I mean, although the, uh, the optical light comes from, um, uh, from a smaller radio, possibly, we mustn't forget that there's lots of dust around. And so the optical light will suffer more scatterings and, uh, and it might uh, be delayed because of that. I mean, we have one example, uh, G107, which is a periodic burst, and you might add it to your, to your list. Um, where we have spitz observations which show that the 4.5 micron precedes the 3.6 micron. So. Oh, okay, yeah. So there is a lot of variety there, as I think Agnes mentioned as well, that, that you know, you do have to look at them all. So, yeah. Okay, uh, we have a question from Zoom. Oh, actually, it looks like it's not there anymore. But Mark, I don't know if you want to ask your question. Yeah. Uh, Oh, yeah, thanks. It was a short one I was putting on, on Slack. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. I was just curious for the periodic stars. Um, how many periods actually are you following? Uh, because, of course, when you fold it, it looks very nice, but I, I'm just wondering. Yeah, no, they're, they're really nice, actually. So um, this is 9.5 year, almost 10 year VVB light curves. The periods are more often a few hundred days, sometimes tens of days. So we have very large numbers of periods and they're very faithfully periodic. I mean, there's a little bit of scatter, but because Jens basically removed anything which had too much residual to the average, you know, face folded light curve, um, they're all good ones. You know, I'm sure that there is there are also going to be quasi periodic ob objects out there because the, the classical pulse decretors, they are quasi periodic, right? It's just that those wouldn't necessarily get through uh, through gen selection. The things like DQ tau and um, UZ tau east, the the the, um, the pulsations come and go from one season to the next. But the way we've selected these, that you almost set your clock by them if you don't want it, you know, if you want it to be accurate within a day or two, I think. Okay, thanks. I look forward to the looking at the paper. I have also last question. It's probably is more a provocation than a question, but uh, I mean, we have seen, I mean, you showed us that uh, there is a, a huge variety here. And uh, I mean, the old uh, definition of uh, force and XOR, this kind of dichotomy that uh, we are, we have been uh, uh, bringing on for many years. I mean, I, I, I'm still, I, I'm wondering whether it's still worth to, define this kind of objects uh, in such a uh, strict uh, definition or dichotomy in a way. Yeah, well, I mean, well, for me, um, when, we, when we write the papers, we try and pretend we're doing physics rather than just observations, right? And so um, we say that we're looking at boundary layer accretion or magnetospheric accretion. And so in that sense, I think, you know, if we, even if we see a 10 year outburst and it's got, it looks like an XOR spectrum, we still say that's a magnetospheric accretion. So in that sense, if we carry on using XOR for, as a signpost for usually magnetospheric accretion, as long as it's not one of your super high mass objects, right? Um, and, you know, the, as long as the, most of the time, the uh, fuel spectra is associated with a, with a genuine boundary layer accretion event and an outburst. Um, you know, I know there are a lot of fuel like spectra that Michael Connolly and, and, and um, and was it Thomas Green found a few some years ago, and and uh, they won't we don't see the outbursts. So you know, there's a question mark about that. But I think as long as we take that as a 
assign a boundary layer versus um, magnetospheric, then it's still a useful label. Okay. Okay. Let's thank again, Phil. So next talk uh, is from uh, uh, Baz Marietz, and it's online. So let me see. Here. Yeah. So the title of our talk uh, is Accretion and Outflow Activity in Proto Brown Dwarfs. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So I'm not sure why this talk was included in eruptive phenomena, but anyway, so I'm going to talk about our recent work, uh, my recent work with John Bali on accretion and outflow activity in class 01 proto brown dwarfs. Um, so the incentive for the talk, uh, for the work was to uh, look into the accretion and outflow activity in early stage uh, proto brown dwarfs, class 01 brown dwarfs. And um, similar studies have been conducted in several class 01 low mass protostars using near infrared spectroscopy, spectral imaging observations, and uh, the typical accretion outflow activity rates are of the order of 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 8 Mson per year with jet efficiencies of 1 to 10 percent. And these studies have resulted in the discovery of several extended uh, Herbert jets. So we wanted to look into um, a relatively larger sample of six proto-brown dwarfs. Uh, the sample was uh, identified uh, by correlating several um, multivalent observations. Um, and in the end, we obtained VLT symphony spectra and spectra images for six proto-brown dwarfs that are located in different regions, Serpent, Sophicus, and Orion. And these objects satisfy the class 01 and stage 01 classification criteria. The bolometric luminosities are between 0.05 to 0.09 Elson. Internal luminosities are also substellar, less than 0.1 Elson. And the total mass derived from the some millimeter millimeter continuum observations are 20 to 60 in Jupiter. So three of these are classified at stage 0, class 0, and three are stage 1. None of these objects lie in confused regions. Uh, we don't see any counterpart, any other source within one arc segment of these objects. So the, our aim was to investigate how the uh, kinematics, morphology, and the activity rates for these objects, particularly the jet efficiencies, compare with protostars and uh, uh, with class two brown dwarfs. So these are the results from, for the stage zero, class zero, proto brown dwarfs. Um, there is a weak emission. Um, there's a detection in the low vibrational levels of H2 lines uh, that indicates that H2 is mainly tracing the coal gas component at less than 6,000 Kelvin. There is strong bracket gamma emission seen in all of these objects, uh, as well as detection in several upper bracket lines of BR13 to 19. Um, the emission in the FE2 lines is, is relatively weak, uh, which indicates that the jet has low excitation conditions or it's mainly composed of uh, molecular material. There's also weak emission seen in fashion beta. It's hardly detected uh, compared to strong emission in bracket gamma. And this, uh, the weak detection passion beta could be due to higher extinction in these objects in the J band compared to the H and K bands. Um, these are the results for the stage one objects at class one. So compared to stage zero, we see very strong emission in the FE2 lines and the passion beta line, whereas bracket gamma is re relatively weak. Uh, there's no detection in the upper bracket lines. Um, the H2 lines that are detected are at higher vibration levels of three to six, which indicates the presence of a hot gas component greater than 20,000 Kelvin. So this shows a comparison of the line profiles for the most prominent lines detected in these objects. Um, in state zero objects, we see very strong emission in the bracket gamma line shown in orange here in the H2 lines. In comparison, stage one objects show a combination of uh, line emission, line strengths, and uh, uh, profiles. The peak in emission in all of these lines is blue shifted. Uh, the bracket gamma line is broader, greater than 200 kilometers per second compared to passion beta, which are narrower, less than 250 to 70 kilometers per second. Uh, the FE2 lines are broader than the H2 lines. 
uh, that have a full width of less than 100 km per second. Um, the peak velocities of the H2 lines are lower, uh, whereas the FE2 lines are uh, show peak velocities of greater than 100 km per second. Um, some of the lines also show a weak redshift at wing, which is more prominently seen in the bracket gamma line. Uh, and this is at velocities, rich to velocities of 20 to 100 kilometer per second. Um, then we, um, for the state zero objects that show a variety, uh, uh, that show detection in several upper bracket lines, we have compared the line profiles for the upper bracket lines with the bracket gamma line shown here in black. Um, one point to note is that the, the kinematics of these lines are quite different. So bracket, uh, bracket 10 is red shifted, bracket 11 nearly uh, overlaps with bracket gamma, then bracket 12, 13 are blue shifted again, 15 is red shifted, 17 is red shifted, and 19 is blue shifted. Um, so the differences in the upper bracket line profiles, the shapes, as well as the kinematics, they indicate that they trace different emitting zones uh, and the size of the zone decreases as the N number increases. All of these are optical, optically thick lines. The optical depth decreases with increasing upper quantum number. So the high end lines are tracing more regions that are more internal, closer to the central driving source than the bracket gamma line. So these are the spectra images in the most prominent uh, output traces, uh, H2 2.12 micron line, and RN2 F1.257 lines, micron lines. Um, extended emission is only seen in uh, two objects, and uh, there's no clear dependence on the stage of the system, evolutionary stage of the system. Um, the, uh, the maximum length spatial extent of these uh, jets are about 600 AU, 600 to 800 AU. Um, uh, in, in the RN2 lines, we see some bright knots that are more extended. Um, overall, the morphology of the protoground objects are very compact. And we see similar compact emission in the accretion traces of bracket gamma and passion beta that peak on source. Um, so we've looked at uh, some of the objects that were uh, observable in the optical, and there are four protoground doors that uh, show uh, 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 bright emission in the optical lines, uh, HL5 and S2 and Owen lines. Uh, these are also extended jets up to 900 to 1000 AU, uh, which is mainly seen in the S2 line images. Uh, so these could be possible new herbic hero jets, uh, but most objects show, most jets show one bright knot, or these are unresolved from the uh, source position. To date, the most extended jet that we have identified is HH 1165. Uh, this is the S2 image for this, uh, for this jet. It's driven by a class one protoground drop M170117, and it shows several bright emission knots with a spatial extent of about 0.26 parsec. So returning to the near infrared spectra, um, the accretion rates that we have derived using several diagnostics, RN2 and H2 lines, uh, sorry, uh, accretion rates are derived from the passion beta and bracket gamma lines and outflow rates from the FE2 and H2 lines. Uh, there's a wide range in the accretion rates from uh, two exponential minus six, so two exponential minus eight Emson per year, while the out, outflow rates show a narrow range between 10 to the minus eight to the 10 to the minus nine Emson per year. The mass outflow rate derived using the RN2 lines are at least an order of magnitude higher than the rates derived from the H2 lines. And we don't see any clear correlation between the evolutionary stage and the activity rates for the protoground dwarfs. So here I've compared the accretion and outflow rates for the protobrown dwarfs shown in red with low mass protostars. And um, covering up, uh, the, the open squares are the accretion rates derived from the passion beta lines and filled squares are from the bracket gamma lines. 
So overall, there's a similar range in the accretion rates for the protobrondos compared to protostars. Uh, there's a narrow rate, narrower range in the outflow rate seen compared to the proto protostars. Um, here I've plotted the outflow rate using the FE2 lines, which are higher compared to the outflow rates derived from the H2 lines. And we see a slight trend of decreasing outflow rates with decreasing volumetric luminosity. Uh, the accretion to uh, accretion luminosity to volumetric luminosity ratios in protobrondos are higher, comparatively higher compared to uh, low mass protostars, which indicates that these are more intense accretion. Uh, there's more intense accretion activity in protobrondos. Um, uh, looking at the ratio of the outflow to the accretion rate or the jet efficiencies, uh, we find a wider range in the jet efficiencies for the protobrondors. Uh, but overall, the range is similar to proto, uh, proto stars, and there may be a possible trend of higher jet efficiency with decreasing volumetric luminosity. Um, so, to summarize, the peak velocities of the RN2 lines in these protobrondos are uh, higher than the H2 lines. And this indicates that the FE2 lines trace the high velocity jet, while the H2 line is likely tracing the low velocity wide angle outflow. So we see two types of flows that is commonly seen in protostars. Um, this class zero protobrondor shows strong emission in the bracket gum and H2 lines, but weak in RN2 and passion beta lines. So there may be a possible evolutionary trend in the jets from a molecular to an ionic composition. Um, the range in the activity rates for the protobrondors are overall within the range that, we made, that has been measured for protostars. Um, and it is comparatively higher than class two brown dwarfs. Um, so we find a decline in the accretion law activity with evolutionary stage, but not with the volumetric luminosity. Um, the earlier stage class, uh, stage zero protobrown dwarfs show emission in the upper bracket lines uh, of 13 to 19 that are not detected in stage one optics. Uh, and we see a very notable difference in the bracket line profile and kinematics uh, that indicates that they arise from different regions. Uh, there's no clear correlation between the evolutionary stage and the presence of compact versus extended jet emission. So we are continuing with the study with a larger sample of uh, 20 targets, uh, and this will help us investigate this uh, tentative trends. And you can find more details in our publications. Thank you. Questions? <clears throat> Questions? Adam? So I may have just missed it, but you were talking about the, the iron line traced uh, emission was, well, let's see, both faster and more mass. You were getting an order of magnitude higher mass loss rates for the, the iron. Is that, uh, can you explain that? Like, is that actually that there's more mass coming out uh, from the, the high velocity jets, or or is, did I just miss it? And that actually just momentum is higher because it's higher velocity. Yes, comparatively, it seems like there's more mass coming out in the high velocity jet, and at least from the simulations of protobrown formations, uh, like from Matida's 2009 paper, uh, the high velocity jet uh, is ejected earlier than the wide angle outflow. Uh, it precedes the low velocity outflow. Uh, so it is expected that there will be more mass expelled uh, through high velocity jets compared to the low velocity outflow. More questions? Okay, mate, uh, I, I probably have uh, a few. So the first one is uh, why uh, I probably should speak here. Why the mass accretion rates? Uh, it seems that the mass accretion rates that you are deriving uh, with the bracket gamma and the passion beta are quite different, right? No, uh, they actually overlap. There's not a huge difference. I mean, you see a systemic offset between outflow rate measured from iron two lines compared to the H two lines, with a, which are open uh, triangles here. But the passion beta lines and uh, bracket gamma lines give similar accretion rates, similar range in accretion rates. Okay, similar range. Okay. And the other question was uh, why you have such a spread uh, uh, in the ratio between the mass ejection rate and mass accretion rate? 
So I think it's because of the wider spread in the accretion rate. Um, the outflow rates are much more constrained over just mm -hmm. one order of magnitude, but you see from minus 10 to the minus eight to the minus six or higher uh, range in the accretion rates. So that is producing this wide uh, range in the uh, jet efficiencies. Right, so basically you are, you are using the, the, the mass ejection rate that you are deriving from the forbidden iron two lines, right? Uh, over here, the mm -hmm. L squares are the average from both lines. So, okay, so the, the, the squares there are, are, are from the forbidden iron two and the, the, open, uh, the open squares are from, uh, from the H2, am, am I right? No. No, open squares are passion beta lines. All right, and the others and are- And the outflow rates are the average, yeah. Yeah. Nuria? Maybe you said, but how are you correcting for extension and scattering yeah, from the so envelope? Yeah, to get them the, the actual fluxes of bracket gamma? Um, so the jet extinction was measured through three different methods uh, by equating the accretion luminosities of the passion beta and red gamma lines by taking the ratio of the iron two lines 1.64 or 1.257 and from constructing the H2 rotation diagram and the jet action extinction comes out to be between 15 and 30 mag. Uh, then the envelope extinction was determined from SED modeling. And uh, that's also about between 10 and 20 meg. Um, so uh, all of these spectra and the spectra images uh, are shown or the, the analysis is done after correcting for the continuum subtraction. Um, I think that's the main method of uh, correcting for the jet extinction. The line luminosity is also jet, uh, 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 calculated after correcting for the jet extinction. More questions? Okay, if not, let's thank again our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Lynn Ilbrand now. It's, um, she should be your line, right, Lynn? Yes. All right. Okay, great. So um, she's from, uh, from, from Caltech uh, and um, she, will talk, uh, she will talk about light curves and spectra and theory. Oh my. Um, okay, well, thank you. Uh, I do wish I were there. Uh, the timing just uh, did not work out for me between uh, classes and some observing and taking my students to Palomar this weekend. So would have loved to have been in Dublin uh, interacting with you all in person, uh, but uh, so it goes. Um, to uh, we'll, we'll work on the character development a little bit later, but uh, the, uh, the scene from the movie uh, depicted here is just before the characters uh, break out into song of lions and tigers and bears, oh my. Uh, and right before they meet the friendly lion and go off to see the wizard. Um, and as I said, we'll leave the character development uh, for later in this talk. Uh, but I wanted to try to frame um, you know, some of what we've uh, been hearing about with photometric and spectroscopic variability with this uh, figure showing uh, the amplitude of the photometric changes uh, uh, versus the time scale, the full cycle time scale. And so how one defines time scale and how one defines amplitude is certainly open uh, to uh, some uh, discussion and, and, and debate. And I think we need some standardization on this in our, in our field. Uh, but what's shown here are in the yellow color at low amplitude is the, the, the stellar phenomena that we observe. And so this is where the high precision photometry is really making uh, a difference in the star spot patterns and flares and pulsations and transiting planets and so on at these low amplitudes. Um, and then when we have uh, multiplicity or binary phenomena that's indicated in the, in the green. Um, and so there are some you know, famous uh, studies of uh, various kinds of eclipsing binaries and uh, young stellar objects with uh, circumstellar uh, disk occultation of the binary and so on. These are all individually fascinating objects. Uh, and what we've been talking about uh, so far 
uh, today and a little bit during this meeting before are the, the blue uh, accretion related phenomena. And uh, we spent a lot of time um, in the previous days on the magnetospheric accretion picture. And uh, we've heard a few other uh, talks again with the, the high cadence, high precision data in this uh, lower amplitude, shorter time scale regime. And then today we've been focusing uh, on the outbursters in this, in this upper right. And uh, just to uh, make the point uh, clear, there are also the, the fading phenomena. Uh, and again, there's sort of a range in, in red here, a range of amplitudes and timescales that are exhibited by uh, extinction phenomena, whether it's uh, you know, dust in the, in the inner magnetospheric regime or further out in the disk. And particularly in these higher amplitude uh, uh, cases, there's, there's certainly ambiguity just from light curves alone about whether we're witnessing a recovery from a deep fade or, or an outbursting event. And that's where the, the follow-up, the spectra, the colors uh, help us in sorting that out. And then we also heard uh, from uh, Greg and a little bit, uh, Herzig and a little bit from Phil Lucas about these uh, protostellar uh, outbursts that are seen more in the infrared uh, or mostly in the infrared because they're not optically visible. And some of what is seen there uh, is probably phenomena occurring in the disk itself uh, as opposed to in the, in the intermagnetospheric region, which uh, we see in the optical. But there are also these uh, you know, bona fide outbursts that are occurring and uh, we don't quite have this phase based mapped out yet. Um, so this is just a, a, a graph to you know, try to help frame some of the discussions. Um, and the point uh, that I wanna make is there's a lot of sky surveying going on these days. Uh, this is an optical uh, figure illustrating one uh, parameter space uh, of the, you know, the grasp of each of these uh, kinds of, uh, each of these surveys. And there are many variables that are important, you know, the pixel size, uh, particularly for our field, the cadence, uh, the duration, we care about long-term light curves, particularly for uh, some of these larger amplitude, longer time scale, young star events, and uh, wavelength, as I said, this is just optical. So this does not include, uh, for example, the NEOWISE, uh, which is all sky uh, in, in uh, mid-infrared three and four microns and other important surveys. Uh, but all of these, um, you know, this parameter space, people are sensitive obviously to what uh, their survey uh, is capable of, of detecting. And so we try to piece all of this together and come up with a good story for the young stars. Uh, so this is just one example of an optical light curve. Uh, so here is a, a source that's changing. This, this is a G and R in the optical, green and red wavelengths. Uh, and so this is a three magnitude uh, variable uh, star that seems to have some quasi periodicity to it. Um, and you know how we interpret this as you know, is this just you know something going on in the inner uh, accretion weather as uh, we've come to uh, start to refer to this, just the, the from the disk onto the star? Uh, are these discrete events that are more of a, a, a burst? Um, is it a, an EX loop type uh, recurring uh, source? Is this even a young star? Um, and so again, this is you know for any individual object, there's a lot of work that needs to go into characterizing uh, sources more than just these uh, just these light curves. Now, as we've heard, uh, some sources are more interesting than others. And uh, I'm highlighting here uh, one of the recent, uh, uh, I, I believe, you know, now confirmed in good FUORI sources that has uh, undergone an outburst within the past few years um, and published uh, uh, here where what's uh, important is the spectroscopy. So this is the uh, multi-wavelength uh, spectroscopy showing wind signatures and uh, some uh, temperature as a function of wavelength, temperature changes as a function of wavelength, which we take as a, a signature of the Euryonis phenomenon. Um, and we need the colors and we need the spectra in order to uh, confirm these things beyond just light curves alone, because um, you know there are lots of, as, as Phil Lucas was saying, there are many sources in the sky and, and Greg Kurtzik as well, there are many sources in the sky that change by uh, several magnitudes and, and we really need this follow up to understand what they are. Uh, so this is a, a recent uh, source that was optically visible. Um, here's one uh, that was identified uh, from an infrared survey uh, going on at, at Palomar called the Catini uh, survey. This was identified as a J-band uh, source that was not visible in two mass. So newly apparent at J-band. And uh, I was able to go back and find you know, some historic data from Tom uh, McGath, uh, coincidentally also taken at the Palomar 200 inch uh, uh, way back when, uh, and compared to a more recent image where you see this you know, brightening and, and a reflection nebulae emerging. Um, and so we were able to recover this in, in the NEOWISE data and uh, do some, do some follow-up where 
uh, the spectroscopic uh, signatures in the infrared, at least, you know, seem to indicate similarity to other uh, uh, confirmed uh, outbursting young stars. So you know, there are a range of these uh, sources that are being discovered. And uh, what I want to highlight, uh, of course, is that these are still quite rare. And I'm plotting here uh, as a function of time. So this is not uh, the rise of a single Ephiori star, though that's an interesting uh, uh, comparison. Uh, this is a, a distribution of when these sources are thought to have had their peaks, uh, where we've actually measured a, a quiescent state and, and an outburst state. And so of course, these first couple of objects are Ephiori itself, uh, V1057 sig, V1515 sig, V1735 sig, and, and, and so on. Um, so, you know, why are there so few of these? These, they're, these are much more rarely discovered than, say, you know, rare events like tidal disruption events, for example, right? There are way more of those now than there are uh, known Fiori young star outbursts. So uh, these unlikely events um, uh, in the universe are being discovered at a much higher rate than, than we uh, young star people are finding these Fiori events. Uh, so why is that? And so the historical uh, explanations are, well, this is an earlier stage phenomenon. You know, these optical surveys aren't sensitive uh, to the protostars. And the data over the past decade in particular, um, you know, are focusing on the, on the infrared. And so we've had uh, some more discoveries. And so that's what's, uh, uh, you know, there's a, a, a change about 10 years ago, uh, again, with the sky surveying that has uh, picked up uh, around the world, uh, you know, we've been better. Uh, so it's basically, you know, every couple, as opposed to one every 10 years uh, for many decades, uh, for the past 10 years, we've been finding these Fiori uh, outbursts and confirming them at a rate of about every once, one every two years. And one might argue that this is even uh, accelerating a little bit uh, more steeply in the recent past. Um, but these are, you know, mainly optical surveys, a few infrared. Uh, but the historical explanation has been that these are hiding in the embedded phase or you know, maybe the rate is actually not uh, what it has uh, been claimed. And, uh, and you know, this uh, story of uh, accreting the mass through these outbursts you know, may, uh, may not hold. Uh, so you know, this is still, you know, I, I think we don't have the statistics quite worked out yet, though there have been some, some admirable attempts and you know, constraints that are, that are appearing out there in the literature. So, you know, undoubtedly this, you know, we are undersampling uh, what's out there. We're doing a better job now, but we're probably still not finding all of the events that are occurring. Hopefully some retrospective uh, views of the archival data that are being assembled will uh, help us uh, fill in events that we've kind of missed in, in real time, but can still uh, study in the future. Um, but uh, on this point of the rates, um, I think that in order to, you know, get the outburst rates, I just want to emphasize uh, you know, we detect what we detect, uh, but how does that correspond to the true outburst rate? And, you know, obviously we need to understand the numerator, right? How many outbursts uh, are we finding? And we need to understand the denominator, uh, and that requires understanding the, the samples and uh, the, the um, you know, the young stars that are being surveyed uh, for, these, for these outbursts. So coming back to this uh, parameter space, uh, just focusing now on the, the bursting uh, type objects, the question is, what do we what do we expect to see at different wavelengths? And in particular, you know, in the context of the the infrared and submillimeter uh, work that's been going on, what do we expect to see at these different wavelengths? So here, I'm just highlighting um, or illustrating a, a simple SED model uh, for a, a, a disk. So the the star is the blue line here, um, and then if you have a, a 0.25 uh, L star uh, re radiation. Uh, of the absorbed uh, light, you might get the blue line. And let's say it's accreting, uh, you would have a 10, a 10 to the minus eight solar masses per year. If you add that together, you have this sort of low state uh, accretion disk. Uh, these are microns, by the way, across the bottom here. And if we uh, uh, suppose that this object goes into some kind of outburst uh, and is now suddenly accreting at 10 to the minus five solar masses per year, what would we expect to see uh, in terms of the outburst uh, amplitude as a function of wavelength. And so uh, what you can see here is the canonical, you know, we're looking for objects that increase by four or five or six magnitudes, and that's based on uh, uh, optical uh, observations and expectations. But as you, uh, as you go into the infrared, you know, this kind of flattens, uh, uh, flattens out. And when you get out to three and four microns, you might expect an event in this particular scenario of only, uh, say, four magnitudes. Um, if we say the, uh, disk is accreting at 10 to the minus seven solar masses per year instead of 10 to the minus eight, 
and we do the same thing, or 10 to the minus six, uh, as one might expect, say, for protostellar uh, uh, stars, objects where their the accretion rates are much higher than in, in the low, later stage, uh, lower m dot t tauri phase. Uh, this is what these outbursts might look like as a function of uh, what, the, what the precursor accretion rate actually was. And so here you see that when you go out into the near infrared and the mid infrared, you know, the expected amplitudes are much, much lower. So this is a, a d discussion that some of us have been having about you know, what do you actually expect to see in the, in the mid infrared. So uh, here's a an, here's an, you know, simple illustration, obviously a toy model, and it doesn't include, there's no accretion shock or anything here. So this is just a, a, an illustrative uh, toy, but I think it's helpful in framing some of what we're seeing in terms of these uh, multi wavelength surveys. Okay. so. Now, the other expectation that we have is that uh, in the low state magnetospheric uh, accretion phase, you know, where we have variable accretion from the disk onto the star, either you know, variable uh, efficiency right at the inner boundary or you know, variable rate at which material is moving inward, whatever it is that's, that's changing, um, you know, we expect in this magnetospheric accretion a uh, certain uh, conversion between what we observe and an inference a, a, a calculation of the accretion luminosity and an inference from the accretion rate of the accretion rate from that that depends on the geometry. Uh, as we go to these uh, larger uh, stage outbursts, at least for the Fiori case, you know we think that the accretion disk comes all the way into the star, and it's a more you know classical uh, accretion scenario. And you might have a boundary layer in here as as well. Uh, and for these intermediate events, so um, uh, Agnes Kospal and others have talked about these ex loop bursts. Uh, you know, it's unclear whether these are still magnetosphere, you know, what the balance is uh, uh, and, and whether these objects represent something that really is intermediate or is, uh, you know, in, in, in one side or, or, or the other. So we're still, I think, kind of working this out. And, you know, the bottleneck here is the spectroscopy. Uh, photometry is, is cheap and plentiful, as I've, uh, as I've highlighted. Uh, the spectroscopy is hard. So here I've stolen uh, all of these figures come from Agnes. Uh, uh, and you know, it's a very nice long-term uh, light curve for the star EX loop, and then the illustration of the, a fainter state and a brighter state of the star based around this uh, 2008 outburst here. So, and then spectroscopically in the faint state, we have all these absorption lines, looks like a normally accreting uh, Titari star, and then the outburst uh, phase in, in red, uh, the object is much brighter at all wavelengths as indicated over here, but uh, you also see the appearance of all of these emission lines, including uh, the CO bandhead. Um, and so, you know, we really want these uh, spectroscopic, the spectroscopic information for as many sources as we can uh, get it in, in various phases of the outburst. And I'll highlight just one other uh, similar kind of object where uh, this is a source uh, we put out a couple of ATELs on, but nothing, uh, nothing more substantial yet, that has undergone, again, these sort of repeated outbursts um, uh, this was one that was identified from the ground. Uh, the black is, here is Gaia data. So it also had a, a little burst in Gaia that seemingly did not issue a Gaia alert. Nobody noticed or paid attention to this one. And then more recently, it's had a larger uh, amplitude event that got even, uh, got even larger than what's illustrated, uh, illustrated here. And that did uh, issue a Gaia alert. And so there's some spectroscopic um, peculiarities uh, that I think are still unexplained for many of these sources. So again, this is one where there's a a low state spectrum uh, here where it looks like a normal you know, M-type uh, uh, star with some you know, forbidden lines and which looks like a normal classical Titari star. And in the outburst state, which is the other, which is the black line here, you see this TIO absorption has become TIO emission, um, which, I, which is rarely seen, but you know, is found in, in some of these outbursting objects. And you'll see the um, uh, potassium and oxygen wind, wind lines that are usually attributed to a wind are seen in absorption against that TIO uh, uh, continuum, so to speak. Um, anyways, the, they're interesting spectroscopic uh, things that are happening in various phases of these young stars. And then uh, jumping up now to uh, a, a true, we think true, although low luminosity, uh, F. Orionis uh, type star, um, here's an object, uh, this is the, uh, uh, in the core of the North American Nebula. Um, so here's an object uh, that underwent this outburst uh, where in the low state, um, it uh, looked like a regular M, mid M type star with uh, uh, H alpha in emission. Uh, this is a spectrum that I had. 
Uh, Bo Rayperth actually has a better uh, quality spectrum than this, but it was you know, clearly just a regular, uh, pretty uninteresting, doesn't, uh, doesn't really even have the forbidden uh, jet lines uh, and underwent uh, an outburst, uh, again, a you know, typical um, you know, five magnitude uh, photometric increase, spectroscopic change uh, to a, um, to a you know, GK low surface gravity object, uh, TIO and um, CO absorption in the infrared. So this classical T of R uh, uh, converting into a wavelength dependent spectral type for, uh, for this source. And I would say that this is probably the first object that has been really well studied you know, with all of the you know, modern techniques that we can, uh, that we can uh, bring to bear. In, there's, very, there's not a lot of information on the low state, but some, but in the high state, I think we've really uh, characterized this object well over the past decade. Many, uh, many uh, papers have appeared. Um, okay, so let's roll back the clock a little bit. Um, so uh, the paper uh, that's highlighted here, this is the a Proto Stars and Planets Review by Hartman, uh, Kenyon, and Hartigan. And this, I think, is where this figure uh, first appeared. But this is where the case was uh, laid out uh, for the Fiori stars being an increase in a disk heating, uh, uh, accretion heating the disk and elevating the temperatures above what you would expect from standard Titari stars and showing the progression, an uh, envisioned progression over time of, of the accretion and this episodic, uh, episodic behavior where the Fiori stars were supposed to be in the earlier phases and the EXOR uh, type outbursts were in the later phases. So, you know, variable accretion has been uh, known and understood for, for, for quite a long time, uh, but this picture kind of uh, laid it out. And what was done here was, you know, to build on uh, you know, the work that had been going on in the, in the 80s um, and this was uh, seemingly focused mainly on this absorption, the absorption spectra. And uh, what's illustrated here are uh, the uh, spectra, which are kind of jagged and messy, uh, even though they're quite high you know, in signal to noise, uh, they have this jagged appearance. And that's because the, that's explained in terms of, of these accretion disks. And so what they were doing in this paper was simply demonstrating that if you had a simple disk profile, like what's illustrated uh, in the upper right, and you uh, performed a cross correlation, you got this sort of you know, double, this double peak thing would show up in the cross correlation. So there are a series of papers. So this is about V1057 SIG uh, showing that in the optical, it had, does have this double peaked uh, profile. Um, the next paper uh, took this to uh, Efiori Onus itself uh, and showed if you compare the optical and the infrared that the correlation width was wider in the optical than in the infrared, meaning it's rotating faster uh, at shorter uh, wavelengths coming from the inner inner part of the disk, um, and so in each of these cases, there's a there's an assertion in the abstract that this is consistent with the uh, with the disk model. Um, then they came back to V1057 SIG and added the infrared uh, and showed the same kind of plot of optical versus infrared correlation widths. And then in the next paper, they put both objects together at both wavelengths, and so now we have Fiori and V1057 SIG. Um, uh, at uh, uh, and demonstrating again the same uh, you know, the same kind of result. This is consistent with the disk model. Um, though I wasn't sure that what it meant by the velocity scale of the optical has been shifted to the correct correlation width, but uh, we'll leave that aside. I believe the data. Um, and then there was this 1988 paper, uh, which I think was great in laying out uh, this disk accretion, uh, you know, a full disk model. And showing again, you know, these sort of jagged uh, spectra were consistent with the disk model and inconsistent with a simple uh, rotating, uh, low gravity uh, type star. Um, and so, and then one final paper, I guess, having left out B fifteen fifteen sig uh, in 1991, there was another paper showing again the, the optical spectrum and then the, the the fact that the infrared spectrum had this uh, CO. Absorption. So again, the spectral type uh, dependence uh, with with wavelength. Um, v V fifteen fifteen has been an, always been an oddity, I think, because it is one of these uh, slowly rotating. It's not one of these nice double uh, peaked absorption line sources. So this one is, has always been a little bit of an oddity, but it does display this uh, wavelength dependent spectral type. Okay, um, so. So this was around 19, these papers had appeared in the late 80s and early 90s. And this is around the time when I was starting to become a cognizant um, scientist. And you know, I was doing other things, but I was aware of these, of these papers. But at the time, 
there were really only kind of the original four uh, claimed Fiori uh, sources. A couple of others had made themselves known, the 346 uh, Nora, which we heard about from, from Magnus earlier, RNO1B uh, had, had also outburst by that time. And then there were a few other sources that were kind of guilt by association. They had the spectra of uh, Fiori type objects, but the outburst had not actually been seen. Um, and as I said, I was doing other things, um, maybe about 10 years later in 2008, Lee, I don't know if you remember, we had a conversation at one of these Gordon conferences. And I remember Susan Edwards was there. Um, and by that time uh, we had taken some data, there'd been two more outbursts identified, I guess. And we had taken some data at one micron uh, on some of these sources. And there were some peculiarities in the spectra. It wasn't really clear this wavelength dependence thing. I don't know, it was sort of a mixed spectral type, but it was you know, kind of G and M mixed together. It wasn't really a, a you know, nice uh, obvious disk spectrum. And I tried to talk to you about this uh, just to kind of point out all of these subtleties. Um, and what I was told was uh, read the two paper, uh, which had come out in 2007, the year before. Um, you know, where everything was solved, of course, it was, it was the disk model. And so um, I did that uh, or had seen it already. And, you know, what was done in this paper very nicely was to apply, you know, similar to the Kenyan model, uh, apply, uh, you know, create a disk where uh, uh, the radiation from different wavelengths uh, could be combined into this uh, disk model to fit now the spectral energy distribution, which I think had not been done before, um, all the way out to 10 microns in this case. Um, okay, so I went off and did other things, uh, and uh, in particular was you know, working and to you know help on this part of the diagram. So identifying various kinds of outbursting uh, uh, sources, you know, sort of one at a time. But you know, in the background, I've been thinking about these spectra and, and have come back to it uh, uh, recently. Um, and so, just to highlight uh, some work that was done by a very uh, capable uh, undergraduate, now graduate student, uh, Tony Rodriguez. Uh, we looked at two of the most recent, uh, recently outbursting Fiori stars. And before I show you our results, I just want to highlight and call attention to, there's a poster uh, by uh, Semkov and collaborators. You know, they've been assembling these long-term light curves for a number of these uh, large amplitude and, and variables and outbursting sources. And this is extremely valuable, you know, particularly all this pre-outburst uh, data uh, which is limited in most cases. There's more for this source than, than many other objects that, that are being found now. But you know, having these long-term light curves and you know, following the outbursts uh, with multicolor photometry is extremely valuable. So I just wanted to highlight that work. Um, but what we've been doing is, you know, I finally, I did read the, read the papers. Uh, and so we've been able to reproduce for some of these um, using the same uh, Kenyan et al. or, or um, Chu et al. kind of models, uh, uh, these SEDs. And, um, oops, sorry, there we go. Uh, uh, some of these SEDs, uh, reproducing them with these disk models, uh, as well as the spectra. So here in red are the data, and these are two different uh, disk models at, at high spectra resolution. So- You have um, five minutes left. Okay, thank you. We'll get there. No problem. Uh, so we've been doing um, you know, some of this uh, modeling work. And so the, the key thing that you want in doing this is we're trying to, figure out M dot, obviously. And uh, you know, this is, has been inferred from, from spectral energy distributions and, and from spectra. Um, and the hard part is you know, we, what we want to measure is T max. And so the maximum uh, temperature in the innermost part of the disk. And so ideally that requires going to the, the shortest uh, wavelengths at high spectral resolution. Um, and so here's an illustration again of just what you might see at different wavelengths. And, and this is hard. Um, uh, in particular, to get these models to match uh, for the next thing that I want to talk about uh, are the, the, the line width. So we want to test that, you know, I think we're still in the process of testing uh, for more objects and, a, and a, a continuous range of wavelengths rather than just, you know, snippets of spectra in the optical and snippets in the infrared. Uh, trying to test this temperature as a function of, of radius, uh, which we observe as temperature as a function of wavelength. Um, uh, and uh, also the velocity, the line widths as a function of, of um, radius and, and, and measured as temperature as well. So again, here is one of these uh, disk models and it's very hard to pick out. There's you know, some isolated lines where you can really see this double peak structure, but for most of the wavelength range, you know, it's kind of a jumble and mix of lines that are, that are broadened. So it's a little bit hard to pick this, uh, pick this, pick this out. Now, as uh, Lee knows, 
there are many uh, attempts at doing this in the, in the literature and in the optical, you know, this is the entire you know, 5,000 to 9,000 angstrom range. It's hard to find these isolated lines and measure their width. And when you do, you get something that's kind of quite flat, right? And not this uh, nice, not consistent with this nice uh, disk model. Um, and it's been hard to extend this in the infrared, though. A couple of highlight a couple of um, uh, uh, papers here where this has been done again, you know, getting a couple of measurements further out in the infrared and showing the disk uh, velocity as a function of radius decline. Uh, and, and this was another object. This is HPC 722. This is B960 MON. So there are a few observations uh, illustrating this drop into the infrared. I'm still hoping that we can uh, do a little better by trying to um, you know, deconstruct these uh, uh, line widths, find the, find the good lines, and, and you know, do more with this. Now, the data, of course, are a little more complicated. They have these blue uh, excess absorption features. And uh, Lee and, and Nuria will tell you that's due to the wind. And it just makes this whole business uh, a bit complicated. Um, I do want to talk a little more about light curves. So let me, let me speed up uh, and highlight a few things. Uh, there is, uh, in, again, these two objects that have occurred over the past decade have offered opportunities for detailed studies. And there's some interesting things about the spectral evolution and the absorption features, uh, both, both the absorption features and the wind features. Um, so in this case, you can see there are some lines. This is a spectral sequence that goes from red to blue. So there are some lines that decrease in strength, other lines that increase in strength over this time. There are subtleties of you know, these, these uh, blue shifted dips and so on. There's a lot of great uh, detail uh, in these kind of spectra. OK, so let me blitz through some light curves and then uh, conclude. Um, so uh, we talked a little bit. That there was a question in the last session about what do, what do these objects look like before they outburst? And so as uh, was answered, um, you know, there, there does seem to be these slow uh, rises before a more rapid increase. Um, we'd like the theorists to tell us more, I guess, about what we should expect. But this is what we're seeing empirically in a number of objects are the slow rises. Um, and then also in the, the cooling phase, right, there are many different shapes uh, of these light curves. So what does the cooling, uh, what can we infer about the cooling physics from the shapes of these light curves? And uh, some, many of these classical objects have been seen, you know, over the past 10 years uh, to be uh, declining. And so again, we have, uh, for the, for the um, earlier identified uh, objects were getting a better sense for their cooling, um, more cooling curves. Uh, as we've known, the outbursts for some time, right, these outbursts are quite diverse. And so these are some of the original you know, Herbig uh, published uh, light curves. Uh, and the diversity of light curves has been known uh, uh, for all this time, both in the outburst, the rise phase, and in, in the K phase. But I think we can do a better job in quantifying them. And so I'm offering here just a few uh, you know, quantitative measures uh, uh, of how we might uh, characterize these. I'm running out of time to actually uh, describe them. But even Herbig actually had this uh, uh, proposed here of measuring the, the time by which the source decays by one magnitude and by two magnitudes. And I had, before I realized that Herbig it's actually uh, before Herbig had actually done this, um, it, this is commonly done in the CV community and uh, you know other uh, compact object uh, light curve analyses. So I think we could adopt some of this, you know, broadly across wavelengths uh, and and research groups to try to do this sort of thing. Okay, so let me let me try to very quickly finish up here. I'll take a minute extra. Um, so here's what happens actually. So if you try to fit these with this logistic function, so trying to match, uh, you know, the the the, the shape of these outbursts, whoops, sorry about that, the shape of these outbursts. So the ones that I can measure myself are plotted here in red. The ones that I can infer in, from the literature are in magenta. Some of these we don't know actually when they outburst. So they're kind of limits here. But you know, like with many other plots we've seen this week, there's a huge scatter here. There isn't a correlation between the amplitude and the time scale, uh, for example, or an anti-correlation. Um, so we don't quite know how to interpret this yet, but I do think that you know we're better able to quantify uh, what's we should be able to better quantify what's going on than what we've been doing thus far. Um, in terms of the theory, uh, you know, here's a paper that we haven't seen uh, yet, but um, you know this is a paper um, promoting infall from the envelope uh, as as causing these outbursts. But what I like and what I what I want to highlight is you know there are details of the light curve, the predicted light curve uh, profiles in, in outburst. And I would like to request this uh, from, from the theorists, you know, help us compare the data uh, by doing some you know, quantitative analysis of, of these profile shapes that would, that would help us a lot uh, in, in connecting the dots here. Um, 
two more points, uh, just small ones. Uh, there are some objects, as has also been mentioned earlier this morning, that have, seem to have these two-step rises. So is that important uh, in the mid-infrared? Uh, you know, is that important for us to figure out kind of physically what's what's going on? And then finally, um, there uh, x-rays were also mentioned. Uh, there's not a lot known really about uh, x-rays from Fiori stars, in part because what's in the literature is a lot of upper limits. Um, however, the ones that are detected, um, this was a nice analysis by Michael uh, Kuhn, uh, they do seem to be higher luminosity in the outburst phase than the typical uh, T-Tauri star, which is shown in blue here. So this is a anal detailed analysis showing this excess luminosity for the Fiori stars. And so the question is, you know, are they enhanced in x-rays because of the outburst? or are the ones with the highest X-ray luminosities the ones that are more prone to outbursts? So I think that's an interesting question um, uh, in terms of understanding the origin of these outbursts. Okay, so just to finish up, um, so I think uh, if I had to summarize, I think of a lot of what the uh, Hartman School of uh, Fiori outbursts would predict. Um, you know, there's this initial instability uh, that's, that's predicted, uh, arises in the inner disk and moves inward. Um, is that consistent with the infrared brightening earlier than the optical? Um, would we expect to see sequential line broadening as a function of, of wavelength uh, as that occurs? Uh, in this temperature gradient with wave and velocity gradient uh, with disk radius, I think we're still trying to map that out in detail. I agree there's a you know, optical infrared, quite clear correlation, but you know, in the details I think are still, uh, there's still some interesting interest in the details. The winds, I haven't said anything about, but the early development of the wind, I think, is also interesting and something we're able to do these days. Um, and you know, the, the detailed disk heating, I think, is part of their observational consequences of that. OK, so this is my uh, concluding slide. I'll just, there were just some uh, points I wanted to highlight uh, about what we've been, what we, the worldwide community, has been doing. But just to focus on what's needed, I think that the progenitors uh, of these outbursts, uh, as we're collecting more uh, data on the spectroscopic and photometric census of YSO populations. It's going to be extremely valuable as future uh, FEORI events uh, occur. I think we can do a better job with the quantitative measurements and the spectroscopic monitoring. Um, if we can find an FEORI star that was previously uh, seen in x-rays, I think that would be interesting too. Um, from the theorists, uh, I think there's still some work that's needed on the, the inner disk physics that will really help connect to what we're observing, which is coming from the inner disk and better, um, quanti uh, better uh, comparison between theory and uh, the observables uh, that we actually measure, including spectra, including multi-wavelength uh, light curves. That would be great. Okay, and then just my last thing is uh, the only paper I've actually written with Lee was this one. Um, where we managed to take a bunch of RAs and decks and make a make a a, a contour plot and uh, fit a radial profile to it in the ONC. Um, uh, hopefully, Lee, maybe we can continue to talk in the future about uh, these FDORI objects. Yeah. So that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I realize I've left questions no time for questions. Lynn. There's Slack. <clears throat> so. Um, you know, how much, although it takes a lot of effort to do the spectroscopic follow-up, uh, and it's it's a little bit easier because in, in those days it took Scott and me hours to get some of those spectra. Um, but uh, one of the things that strikes me is that the observations are getting way ahead of the theory by, you know, orders of magnitude. And it would be nice if we could get funded to uh, either do either part of the work, right? Um, and the, an ex, but an example of this, just even forgetting about outbursts or anything, Shawan has this beautiful, full uh, ideal MHD simulation of an FUORI state. Uh, it's turbulent, it's got a wind, and nobody has taken that data and uh, computed the, the observational indications of, of that. The, 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 you could do high, uh, and it wouldn't be trivial to do, uh, but to, just to do the radiative transfer to calculate all the line profiles, to add them up, to look at the, look at what departures there are from Keplerian, all that stuff. Uh, I got Shalon to give me a, a one, one time snapshot and I was, you know, in my dreams, I was gonna do some radiative transfer, but of course that's never happening. So, um, we really need some 
some more theoretical funding and uh, to just try and catch up because otherwise, you know, you can take all these beautiful things, you can see the two-step rises and so on. And, and uh, uh, we have all this physics that I think is there and it, in the observations. Uh, and I, I don't know exactly when we're gonna be able to, to, to catch up. Patrick? Yeah, hello, uh, th thanks, Ine. I, I, I'm particularly interested by, um, when you, you mentioned that there is possibly a paucity of uh, F Orionis effect, and you may you said there may be embedded, uh, they may be hidden in the, in the I mean in the accretion phase. Uh, well, actually, they may not hap happen at all, uh, possibly because high accretions will hit uh, the source around and stabilize the disks. And so the question is, is it? Do you have any means to relate the F Orionis? event with the nature is it is it possible for instance that we see the f ionis events only if say the the envelope is gone or you know with the age of the protostar typically because well, i mean I, you would expect that from simple considerations yeah i think in the past it's been hard because we've studied objects in the Alper space, right, with all of the modern techniques, which in, I would include as, you know, submillimeter, millimeter, mid-infrared, uh, high spatial resolution, um, high spectral resolution, all of that. Uh, I think th at the same time, we've been assembling the, the stellar census information from surveys and understanding the YSO populations across the galaxy much better. So I think in the future, you know, as these events go off, we will understand more about the progenitors, you know, the, the low state Titari or protostar phase, then we have for, you know, Fiori itself, we don't know what it was before it outbursts, right? Uh, and the same with many of these other classical objects, they only became known, you know, once they did something interesting and then we tried to study them, but they were already in the high state. So the historic record, you know, is not great for the, the, the pre-outburst object. I think going forward with, you know, the past you know, decade of, of surveys, optical surveys, spectroscopic surveys, infrared, where we've identified the samples. In the future, when these events happen, we'll know, oh, it was that star and it had this property. It had these x-rays, it had this SED, it had this spectral type, it had this M dot, right? There will be objects, we hope, <laughs> that we've well, we've studied well now that, you know, when they outburst, we'll, we'll know more about them, so. I, I think that's the state of, of where we are. So we're laying laying the groundwork now for, for future studies and, and you know, but we have different capabilities in different times, right? We had NEOIs for the past 10 years and it'll go on for another year or so, and that's it, right? That's done. There will be no more mid-infrared surveying. So that data will not be available. So we're just kind of seeing in each of these objects, we're seeing a, a piece, a snapshot, uh, but whether something's going up or coming down, right? We only have that data available for a certain time. So. I think the future is bright for this, um, but we don't have all the data we want at the time <laughs> for all the objects we want. Um, I actually have a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Um, it's about uh, the um, rising, the, the double rising that you see in the mid infrared, right? So, do you have a? The first question is: Do you have any idea of what is causing this? Is a preheating of uh, uh, somehow of the inner gaseous disk or something. And the other question is, um, could, I mean, in principle, this could be used in the future to um, trigger uh, the observations uh, in advance uh, to detect, to really study uh, this kind of burst at the very beginning? Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, you know, as I said, we have I think we'll have optical surveying forever, right? But I think these infrared and, and some millimeter, right? We have to you know, pick and choose what, what, what we look at. And as I said, the NEOIS data will go away at some point. Um, yeah. yeah, so I think those rises are interesting for you know, these, these slow rises are interesting for identifying potentially interesting objects. But looking back at the, at the, at the record of adding Spitzer and NEOIS, right? That's um, almost 20 years, I guess, 15 plus years. Uh, you know, I just think we're in this intermediate phase and it can be a long time, right? An object can have a rise and it can have this second shallow phase that can last for 10 years, right? So there are a few objects that have shown that. Also, I just want to say that uh, 
there do there are objects that are flat lined that didn't do anything between Spitzer and Wise. So I know I've only highlighted the ones that have done <laughs> shown these jumps, uh, but there are objects that are that are flat. Okay. All right. If there are no other questions, let's thank uh, let's thank uh, I, uh, Lynn again. Right. Uh, our next spe speaker is uh, uh, Peter Abram from the Concoli Observatory, and uh, he will talk us about uh, young erupting stars uh, at the highest angular resolution. Thank you for the introduction, and thanks for the opportunity that I can present some results of our group at Budapest at this great conference. So my title is Younger Active Stars with the Highest Angular Resolution. Of course, why do we need the highest angular resolution? We heard several times today that the typical time scales associated to this eruptive phenomenon is basically years. We have some months, a few years, but if we transfer this one year time scale into some dynamical time scale under which you can really change considerably the density distribution of the disk, you arrive to this one AU thing. So it's not a big surprise. Eruptions are related to the inner 1AU part of the disk. It's our question, how can you explore this little word, which looks even tiny, even the best uh, ALMA images? Well, if you start from the theory way, then my advice would be just employ Lee Hartman, and he will construct your models and invent ideas. If you are like me, less imaginary, <laughs> That we can discuss later. Uh, if you are less imaginative and a simple-minded observer like me, then just use interferometry time series spectra like this. Some questions which we had no time to answer yet. Uh, of course, we are interested in the structure of the inner disk in this younger active stars. Wanted to know whether they look typical as a normal titular star, so they show some very strange features which could be responsible for the outburst. Also, whether if we look and analyze carefully the structure, maybe we learn something about the uh, physical mechanism. There are some, some marks uh, which, which helps us to figure out the outburst physics. It's very interesting also look at the temporal variability of the system, because we look at the response of a perturbed system, and it always tells us something when a system returns to equilibrium. And if you follow just the evolution like this light curve before, then again, we may learn something about outburst physics. Living in a planetary system, we are naturally interested in the impact of the outburst on the planet forming zone and terrestrial zone. And finally, we also would like to know what is the feedback of these eruptions to the neighboring interstellar medium. So our tools, which I will report today, is basically the infrared interferometry. Uh, the European Southern Observatory has this wonderful uh, mid-infrared interferometer, uh, which uh, the VLTI at Paranal, which has two instruments. One is the already decommissioned MIDI. It worked between 2003 and 15. It could connect, actually, and measure the interference bit between the signals of two telescopes. So you. There are more telescopes in the mountain, but MIDI could connect two of them and produce spectrally resolved or so spectra interferometry in a 10 micron band. The resolution, three, four milli arc second. That's really something here. But because we have just a very few numbers to interpret the results, we have to use modeling. We don't have images. In the second generation interferometer, it's called MATIS. It's com commissioned recently. It can connect all four telescopes and uh, can go also for shorter wavelengths, L, M, and N band. And we are in a position to start attempting image reconstruction. So, model independently, look what is inside of these systems. Uh, in Budapest, we have some expertise for that because we run one of the European uh, VLTI expertise centers. So, we work in this direction. The first project I would like to mention here. This uh, related to the archive of the MIDI instruments, so the first generation interferometer. Looking at the archive, actually, it became clear that it contains a lot of young stellar object measurements, and most of them are unpublished. So we just created a homogeneous, performed a homogeneous reduction of all these uh, sources, and found 82 young stellar object disks. Among them were seven 
a Fiorinus and four XOR type objects. In addition to publishing the reduced data, we also performed some simple-minded, easy geometrical models. It's called temperature gradient model to all of the disk, which has only two parameters. What is the inner radius of your disk? And what is the temperature profile? The trick what you have to do, that in the interferometric observations, if you have several pairs of telescopes, it means several lengths of the baselines, then you just measure the interference signal with increasing baseline, and, you and it will contain information about the shape of the object. Uh, this is seen here in this, in this figure. So our result was that surprisingly large ratios, more than a third of the, of the disk, showed an inner radius which exceeded the dust sublimation radius. But only one of the seven fewers did it. Exos look quite average and boring in that sense. In order to make it a bit more quantitative, we run uh, radiative transfer models. On the right hand side, you see a big collection, big grid of models, including gaps or not including gaps in the inner part. Green, green area where we have gapped model, blue where we don't have any gaps, so the, the, the inner radius of the disk is really close to the star. If you have a good eye, you will see that all the fjords actually fall into, most of them fall into the blue zone. So it enforces the, the statement at the bottom that it seems from this very small sample that if you're in stars, don't like to have inner discs, inner cavities. I don't know why. The same uh, study actually can tell us something about the temperature profile. In this uh, black histogram shows you the whole 82 uh, or the non-eruptive non young stellar objects, which uh, peak a temperature exponent around 0.5. Our four XORs in average follow the same. They just look boring in that sense, but a few fewers show much steeper temperature distribution at the center than the average or the typical young stellar objects. So it seems that, that that's also a result. After the MIDI data, when the new area of the MATIS instrument came, we were among the first to start using the guaranteed time to observe fjords. So we went for F Orionis. What else could be our first target? We got a lot of epochs, actually five epochs. And uh, with a lot of work by now, we, uh, in a we, we could fabricate actually a radiative transfer model, which seems to fit the spectral energy distribution, has a nice image. And even it fits the interferometric measurements, that is the size information on the source. Believe me that here, this color and the black symbols are very close to each other. It means that we reproduce the interferometric measurements as well. The main parameters of our model are listed here. The model actually has two components. At the center, we placed this analytical, classical, small, accretion disk model with a constant accretion rate. And, uh, and uh, this is used as a light source for the remaining part of the disk. So it's not the star which illuminates your disk, but this is a small, small accretion disk, which overshines the, the star. It has a very, it has a smaller radius in our model than used to be earlier. It's only 0.2 astronomical unit. But uh, otherwise, the outer disk looks just normal. The disk mass, what we got, it looks normal or low. Normal, that is like many other t tauri stars. Low, as Agnes pointed out, if you compare the disk mass with the mass dumped already on the star in the, on, uh, in the last 100 years, then it's a bit worrying situation that we have a sim similar order of magnitude. So, that is one quantity which is not uh, plotted here, that is the so-called visibility, which tells you how point-like is the source for the interferometer. And it was pretty point-like. It was a surprise how small and confined looks F is compared to the expectation. It means that the visibility is high. It's close to the point source value. And uh, we had to conclude that the mid-infrared emitting region for F is small. 
it was a bad news because we really planned a very nice imaging program, image reconstruction program on this with the interferometer, but we had to cancel because why to image a point source? Nothing special was there. We have also data for another FU on instar object called V900 mon. We just in the process to uh, producing a radiative transfer modeling, but already started with just plotting the, the spectra, the 10 micron spectra, what we get. The different baselines sample different disk areas. Here at the top, I plotted in blue the spectrum, which you get with the shortest baseline, meaning it basically captures the light of the whole disk. If this is this trapezoidal shape, it's nothing special. But if you go for longer baselines that is sampling the, the smaller and smaller area, then you get more and more strange shapes. First, we were really happy. That's a fantastic uh, result that we show a nice radial distribution of the dust properties. So we have really very different dust inner and outside. How exciting is it? Then actually, I just thought that why not to compare the spectra, what you get in the inner part, with the spectrum of the whole disk, the outer disk. And they seem to overlap quite nicely part. And there are parts where they don't overlap. The region they don't overlap spectrally, it corresponds more or less the region where the normal amorphous boring uh, interstellar dust particles produce absorption at 9.6 micrometers, something like that. So actually our uh, interpretation at the moment, that probably it's not the dust properties which would change radially, but we have some little cloud, I should have, pointed here, but I draw here a little cloud at the center, which somehow absorbs light at the very center, and it causes this missing flux around the 9.6 micron. If this is true, it would be surprised because this is a pole on system. So you really don't expect any dust cloud just on top above the disk. But if it's so, at the moment, this is our interpretation. So we may have an absorbing dust layer above the inner disk. Could it be the accretin material? Could it be an opposite way, a dusty polar outflow, a streamer, which is now a, a favorite thing that some clumps in the envelope, we, we just don't know at the moment, but we may, we see some material outside the disk, it seems. If we talk about the streamers, it's, it's another question whether what the structures that people see around f star, for example, this f itself, and you see that it's a polarized image, whether these structures would come really close to the star and interferometry could be a tool to tell it, even if we can't do imaging at the moment, but there is a nice interferometric quantity close, uh, called the closure phase, which tells you how asymmetric is the distribution, how circular or how asymmetric. And here, actually, we really found some asymmetry because it's non-zero, this closure phase, for, again, for f uranus. We were happy that we found something interesting again. But then my colleague came and told that, but look, if the, if the disk is just inclined a little bit, like here, it naturally causes an asymmetry if it, 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 it deviates from the circular asymmetry. And he modeled it. And the black line actually just goes over the observation. So the conclusion then in the other way, we at the moment don't see any definite asymmetric structure very close to f -Uri, and this is the same for v 9 one as well. Related question, one can ask if we see some new companions which haven't seen so far. Uh, at the moment, actually we, uh, we simulated the signal, but we should see the sinusoidal signals. And we looked at, the, at our uh, MATIS and MIDI data, many objects, and we haven't seen any. So today is not the day to announce a new companion to one of the Fiorini stars, unfortunately. Okay, there are several other topics which I won't have time to touch now. Uh, I wanted to, to show that this object V1647 Orion is produced an outburst in 2003 and faded in 2005. And we have interferometric observations at the plateau phase and also at the beginning when it started fading. 
And the two, interestingly, the observations showed that the source was faded, but what we saw in the data that the innermost part, the central part faded faster than the outer part. It is just counterintuitive because you would think that if you turn down the lamp, then the whole thing becomes smaller, more point-like. So we would expect just that opposite. And we had to, to make some proposed and modeling some, some uh, possible extension of the inner uh, cavity at the end of the, the outburst. I just wanted to show that from uh, observations, time, time is of observations, more than one interfering observations, we can get really interesting results on the changes of the inner disk. Similar was this mentioned B346 normy. If you looked at the 10 micron absorption, because it has an absorption feature, it's obvious visually that uh, we have very, very different. Uh, so the depth of the absorption feature changed over the years. It became by 2016 much deeper than was in 2004 or five. Calculating the tau, the optical depths, and plotting these values, and comparing with a very interesting light curve of the star, we see that it, the star showed a, a big dip in 2008, and it's brightening back. And this is somehow uh, correlated with the absorption. So somehow this dip is correlates with the increase of extinction to, in the line of sight. We don't know whether it's some dust condensation or rearrangement of the envelope, but something like that. Okay, maybe the last topic I show then here, that is, a, if we have an interferometric observation, then we have a several baselines. So we can really sample different parts of the disk. And you can look at uh, dust properties, how it changes radially. Actually, the, the idea came from this Van Buckel Nature paper 2004, that for her big stars, he found that the innermost part he found nice crystalline features because in a the, in the hot environment, crystallization happened, but the outside was more amorphous of the disk. We thought that we should see the same in the fjords because at the center, you have even more heat than in a Herbig star at the outside. But plotting actually the spectra of F is in an increasing order again with the baselines, we don't see any obvious trend, and we don't see any signal of the crystalline particles. So our crystals somehow disappeared, they are lost. So if you find them, please tell me where, where are the crystals of, of F. Uranus. Okay, I think, thank you very much. Questions, please. Uh, Peter, so how far out in the disk do you think uh, the uh, silicate feature is coming? I'm sorry. What, what radii? What what radii do you think are characteristic of where the? If you remind me, uh, remind us what the silicate emission feature. Where where is it formed? How far out? Is the temperature is typically starts from a few hundred k up to thousand, even above thousand k. So this is typically a few astronomical units where we see this, this silicate. Already the, the innermost radius and out to a few. Peter, very nice talk and very good results. Uh, yeah, compliments. Uh, for what concerns you reanalysis of the media data, right? You were saying that um, only one, one of those stars uh, has a, a, a radius which exceeds the sublimation radius, right? Mm -hmm. So let me guess, this is an XO. Uh, I, I have to check that object. Because, I mean, uh, is. given the accretion rate of uh, F, uh, F, uh, F, uh, F, uh, yeah, first, right? Why should this stop? The dust stop before the, the, the sublimation temperatures. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Actually, this is the V eight eight three Orionis, which is one of the. It, it, it's clear that it's a, it's a fewer. So actually, as one need to look at the data more why it produces this this virtually higher inner radius. 
Any more questions? Okay. So maybe I, I can ask you uh, one question. I was quite intrigued by the um, by by the visibility of uh, uh, FUR. Mm -hmm. um, so because it appears really compact, right? And I, I was wondering uh, why so compact. Could it be that um, um, actually what you are seeing there uh, is uh, more the central source rather than uh, the outer than the disk itself because uh, because of the silicate feature, right? So the sorts of the silicate feature. Or I don't know certainly that the inner part, this absorption, uh, that this accretion disk, it will. Uh, Produce a, a a lot of lights and make it it makes it point like I, I, I actually I, I don't know I forget to put my conclusions just at the end so <laughs> <laughs> but it, it tells you that we, we can start to synthesize a little bit uh, these results so the first part is related to a question that if there is no inner cavity and the hot disk regions links seems to be small. And the temperature profile is steep. And I did not show it, but some analytical model seems to fit the data. It means that that accretion disk that Lee used to, to, to use, actually seems to work. So it's absolutely consistent with all, all, all the uh, observations. The my, uh, second point was that there may be some matter outside the disk. And it may mean that the streamer or cloudlet capture scenario, it also may, may work. And we saw some measurable changes in the structure over a few years, which probably related to the outburst. And the lost crystals have not been found yet. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I don't think, sorry, Greenfried, I don't think that we have. Okay, just very quick. I mean, uh, you rated it once with modeling, right? Not only reproduce the SED, but also the image, right? Yes, okay, yes, so yes. Then the, the structure is. The structure space, is there right? on the image. Right. Thanks. Okay, let's thank again our speaker.